are now open and ready to take our women in who are being abused. The facility will accept clients even while we continue to receive donations and build out our programs to help women to rebuild their lives and get back on their feet. I use this opportunity, Madam Speaker, to read out the 24-hour hotline numbers for women who need the shelter. 876-553-0372 or 876-929-2997. The other two properties are now in early reconstruction and or refurbishing stages and will be transformed quickly into safe spaces for women. Welcome to PBCJ's coverage of the Lower House. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. The session will start at first, followed by a roll call of those in attendance. This is usually followed by questions and answers to questions, statements by ministers, items under public business and private members motions before we begin though let's try a parliamentary trivia question true or false a joint select committee of parliament is often established to review legislation being considered by members of the upper or lower houses of parliament get the answer at the end of this introduction in this session's agenda Minister of Labor and Social Security Pernell Charles Jr. is down to make a statement under public business, the Appropriation Amendment Act 2024. That's what's on the agenda. It should be noted that elements of the day's agenda can be changed or moved. But before we go, here are a few things you should bear in mind if you plan to attend a session at Gordon House. No visitor shall create any act of disorder within the precincts of the house. No visitor shall be admitted to the house without first obtaining an admission card. Visitors who remain within the precincts of the house during a suspension of the session are asked to keep silent. No photography, videography, or sketching of the proceedings is allowed unless so authorized by the presiding officer. It's almost time to go to the main event, but before that, let's get the answer to the trivia question. We asked, true or false, a joint select committee of parliament is often established to review legislation being considered by members of the upper or lower houses of parliament. It's true, joint select or standing committees are established under the standing orders of each house. The powers and proceedings of joint select committees are determined by resolution of both houses. For example, a joint select committee is established to review the job descriptions and code of conduct for ministers and members of parliament. The committee was also tasked to articulate an accountability framework. We can also remember that it was proposed that a joint select committee of parliament should be established to review the proposed amendments to the Domestic Violence Act. A joint select committee of parliament reviewing the Sexual Offences Act Offenses Against the Persons Act and the Domestic Violence Act and the Child Care and Protection Act had recommended that a committee be established to review the Domestic Violence Act on its own. A joint select committee was also established to enact strong comprehensive tobacco control legislation at one point. Now over to the proceedings. Mr. Charles Jr., Here. Mr. Green, Here. Mr. Morgan, Mr. Hutchinson, Here. Mr. Terrellong, Here. Ms. Smith, Dr. Dunn, Lynn, Mr. Main, Mr. Davis, Mr. Whittle, Mr. Brown, Dr. Brownberg, Dr. Charles, Mr. Chin, Mr. Cousins, Ms. Crawford, Ms. Daly, Ms. Davis, Mr. Golding, Mr. Graham, Dr. Guy, 
Ms. Hamilton, Ms. Hanna, Mr. Enriquez, Mr. Henry, Mr. Hilton, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Lawrence, Ms. Lee, Mr. Miller, Mr. Montague, Ms. Morrison, Mrs. Nita Garvey, Mr. Paulwell, Mr. Phillips, Dr. Phillips, Mr. Robertson, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Samuda, Mr. Shaw, Mr. Siblis, Mr. Slowly, Mrs. Vaz, Mr. Warmington, Dr. Wheatley, Mr. Williams, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wright, Mr. Chuck, Statement, my ministers. Uh, I may. Wait, let's, oh. Mr. Speaker, thank you for calling on the House Leader. <laughs> At this time, um, Mr. Speaker, um, we have a statement by Minister, um, Minister Charles, Colonel Charles Jr. We make a statement. Thank you. Before we get into the formal agenda, having celebrated Taki Day yesterday and coming here to hear a prayer swearing allegiance to His Majesty the King, is it not full time that this parliament reviews the standing orders and insert an appropriate prayer on behalf of the people of Jamaica to their sovereign God? Let us change the prayer. If we can start there. So I would, I'm trying to call on the leadership of the House because I understand that the standing orders committee is in session and does have regular meetings. And I believe the time is here for us to examine that matter and to, as the process of constitutional reform gets on the way, we could start with that. Minister. If you permit me just to remind through you, Mr. Speaker, that section 34 of the constitution stipulates that the constitution that the parliament of jamaica consists of the monarch the house of representatives and the senate and just to remind that the constitutional reform work is well on way and until then the formalities will remain thank you very much statement by minister thank you Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I rise this afternoon to update this Honorable House and Matters. Sorry, Minister. Yes. Are there any copies? They, they, they will be distributed. Um, they will be distributed. They're, they're on their way. It's, it's a brief update. I don't think uh, we'll have any difficulty if you, as you hear. But the copies will be distributed. What I will do is Madam Speak Mr. Speaker, I've sent an electronic copy to um, colleagues and they can share it. But it is it will be distributed and I don't think anyone will have a difficulty with what is said. With your leave I'll proceed. Continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. This afternoon, I rise to update this Honorable House briefly on matters relating to the Overseas Employment Program, better known as the Farmer Program, as per our commitment to highlight also a few of the plans going forward. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you will recall that we recently held a very successful and informative 
sensitization session with our members of parliament um, and we follow up with this statement to the nation um, on the updates and just on some of the the matters relating to the vision going forward we cannot deny mr speaker that this program has had um, a massive impact on thousands of lives um, individuals families communities and as we move forward we are making every effort to ensure the sustainability of this program uh, mr speaker over some 80 years eight decades these programs have evolved from where Jamaica was the main supplier of labor to now a highly competitive labor environment which demands us to be therefore more prepared, more responsive. And if we are to maintain our competitive status, we must uh, be ready and prepared uh, more effectively. Also, uh, for us to be able to secure those additional opportunities for our people. In the case of the United States, there are now more than 88 countries uh, that supply workers to agricultural employers. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, this means that Jamaica must therefore take very active steps to grow our program and secure our competitive edge. During my ministerial visits to both Canada and the U.S. last year, we spent a lot of time listening to employers and our farm workers and other stakeholders um, and they highlighted a number of challenges uh, which we are making every effort to address some employers expressed disappointment in terms of the number of workers who get, who go a wall which is absent without leave and we see this as we have said several times um, <clears throat> as something significant in terms of impacted and jeopardizing the program and for the other persons who have the potential of joining the program. So Mr. Speaker, when we discussed this last year, we gave a commitment to improve the selection process and to better prepare our Jamaican workers, our candidates to perform well when they go overseas. We will therefore be introducing a range of strategies to do so in order to boost the program. These include building the capacity and employability uh, skills of workers through human resource development and training, improving service delivery to both workers and employers through the ministry and through our liaison service, and strengthening of the capacity of the program to satisfy the needs of our workers as well as our employers, both of whom are critical to us um, in this partnership. As you're aware, as a part of the regular process, candidates who we nominate are called upon to ensure that they are literate and numerate, and everyone can understand why. The example that we give all the time is if you are on a farm or if you are in an office or if you are um, in a greenhouse, you have to have the capacity to read labels in particular take instructions, not just orally, but in writing, to protect yourself and to protect the integrity of the operation. We are also enhancing, Mr. Speaker, colleagues, the, en the assessment process with a psychometric tool to get better insight into the personality profile to determine best fit. As you know, uh, for success, it is your attitude not your aptitude that determines your altitude. And we've discussed it several times, and we got the support of, of colleagues on the other side in terms of introducing uh, tools that will allow for us to have best fit and suitability for persons to also be in, better informed of what they're going to in terms of work. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I had indicated, during the sensitization session with the MPs in, in January, the ministry will be collaborating also with Heart and STA Trust uh, to prepare workers for work through employment readiness training. Candidates, candidates will also engage in crop propagation courses at one of our agricultural institutions, um, and we intend and we look forward to sharing further details on this 
uh, during my sectoral presentation. The goal is to be more deliberate um, and to be more consistent in terms of providing support for our Jamaican workers to be best prepared as they go overseas. A lot of the complaints we find, Mr. Speaker, um, are not just on the living conditions, but they're coming from persons who have great disparity between their perception and the reality. And so we find that we have to take more time in a conscious way to ensure that our Jamaicans, myself and Dr. Dunn, are on the ground ensuring that they know what they're going towards and what they're getting into. I want to encourage my fellow parliamentarians, Mr. Speaker, to conduct your own screening. I know that several parliamentarians um, have been doing this, and I want to use this opportunity to thank the several on both sides who have come to me and given some insight and recommendations in terms of the process that you utilize um, and how we can help to streamline that across the country. The goal is to make sure that we are selecting the most suitable candidates for the program. And let me reiterate at this time the criteria for participation. Mr. Speaker, uh, to satisfy, to, to, to be eligible rather, you must be between 21 and 45 years of age. You must be literate. You must be able to read. You must hold a valid Jamaican passport. You must have a NIS and a TRN no criminal record, able to work long hours and to perform work that is physically demanding. You must have some experience in farming and preferably be registered with RADA. Uh, you must never have been previously disqualified from participating in any of the ministry's overseas employment programs due to medical or any other reason. And finally, uh, we require that you have not been deported from any country. Mr. Speaker, to assist our MPs' efforts, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security will be hosting two online sessions, and we've put it online to make it easier, less burden for persons coming from far. Um, but two online sessions to help, to provide guidance to our parliamentarians or your representative in terms of the process to conduct pre-screening activities. So we're not just telling you to do it. We are giving you the support and the tools needed as members of parliament, as teams in your constituency, to effectively carry out uh, the pre-screening. And this is going to be done. Both sessions will be held this Thursday, April 11th. And those details were sent to members of parliament previously. The measures mentioned above, Mr. Speaker, are aimed at improving the program. That's the bottom line. Building trust and cooperation of workers and the long-term commitment of employers. These are the important elements for the development and the further growth of this very important program. So we look forward to our members of parliament or the representatives that they choose being a part of these sessions. Um, and again, if members of parliament checked their email, they would have received a very important email with specific details to guide you on who to call if you need further information and also on the process that we're engaging this month. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for um, reiterating some of the issues that he has just done. Um, we did have the session um, earlier where a number of persons participated and a number of the issues that you have raised here we raised and we had that discussion. Um, I understand the importance, especially as we are now entering into another cycle of selection, so I think that the information is um, welcome and it is important so that the rest of the country is also fully aware of that. Minister, I, 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 um, uh, as I did before, I welcome the employment readiness and that kind of training that we are doing. I want to make sure, though, against my own experience and the experience of many others, 
that the sequence of nomination, training, selection, and so on, and the new strictures that we're putting in place, that they're done in a way that does not increase the possibility of subjectivity, yes, or of any interference. Um, I think it is important because of some of the feedback coming from persons who go for the interviews about questions asked, statements made that might point to some level of subjectivity. And I kind of just want to make sure that that isn't, isn't so. Um, <laughs> Diplo I'm learning a little diplomacy. <laughs> um, so, so that is one. The other minister, and you spoke about it, it, you are absolutely correct that we have to have a balance between uh, the workers and their expectations and what they're going through and um, what they're seeing and the complaints and so on, as well between that and that of the farmers in terms of the standards that they have there and in terms of all of that. If my memory serves me right from all of the documentation that we have seen, a big issue is really about making sure that there is a clear channel um, through which individuals can actually make complaints and that they can feel as if those complaints are being taken seriously, yes? Um, and I am hoping that part of what we are doing is also ensuring that the role of the liaison officer, for example, is one that helps to close that gap where persons thought that they really were not being properly served. So um, I, I want to say that. I also um, want to make sure, Minister, that with what we're doing now, that we can also have uh, a more consistent follow-up in terms of once we have sent in the nominations, what happens? Because often as members of parliament, you only hear of anything happening when somebody comes back and visits the office and says to you that, you know, I went up and I came back. We are not regularly, I'm not saying we have not been, because sometimes I know we have gotten the reports and the feedback, but it has not been consistent, yes? And it has not been detailed enough. So for me, those would be the issues. We haven't heard, Minister, um, of how, the, how, how we get into the heart, heart programs and those. I suspect that the sessions that you're doing will probably um, include some of that. So I await that as well. I'm always one also for psychometric testing and so on. I want to make sure, though, that they're culturally relevant. Um, because sometimes we tend to adopt and adapt some of these um, principles that are sound, but they are not necessarily culturally um, relevant in terms of their application for us. I just want to follow up on two points raised by my colleague. In terms of the criteria for selecting the persons to go on the program, I think it's important in feedback to indicate to applicants where they may have been deficient in the process. So for example, as an urban MP, most of my applicants will not have farming experience, apart from backyard farming. Most of them, they, they won't have RADA certification. So not all of them run away. But even with that, some of them have the aptitude to do good work. So if the issue is if they are turned back because they lack the farming experience, then they need to be told. And as Norman Dunn say, them feel them hand miggle and say, the hand miggle soft and them can't do hard work, right? Mine may not be tough, but me probably do more work than most of you inside here, right? But, but I'm just saying, the, the feedback is important to the applicants, and I believe the feedback is important to the MPs. Because while we will do our own screening, it's important to say to us, of the number that we sent, 20 never met the screening because of X, Y, Z. So that the next round, we make sure we deal with those kind of issues. So I'm just asking that in, in, the, um, in the process, eh? What, rural what? Yes. No, we do real farming, you know. I, I have... 
proper, not, not uh, proper backyard farming. Uh, people who do chicken, uh, people who do pig, uh, do all of those things. And, and I can tell you, there are many, there are some of those who have gone for, on the program from urban areas who have stayed, who have done the program proud. So I don't want urban MPs to be discriminated against in any way, shape, or form. But those issues, Minister, I believe you, you can address. Minister. Thank you. Minister, for the last few years, whenever the, the requests for applicants or nominees for the program has come to the members of parliament, it is male specific. And I would just like to know what, or are there any issues with the female program? Because for quite a number of years now, we have not gotten any requests for female farm workers or female overseas program. So can the minister state if there, are, there is an issue with that program? And if yes, what are the issues? Thank you, colleagues, um, for your questions and your comments and your recommendations. Um, let me just indicate that uh, most of what you have said is in accordance with uh, the intentions and with the policies that we have developed. Um, uh, the psychometric test is intended to identify persons who have the right attitude and to complement the competence and the ability because it is clear to us in our discussions with employers and also with the more experienced farm workers that simply knowing about farm work or simply being able to do farm work is not sufficient for you to handle and to really to perform well in the program. So I'm glad that you welcome the psychometric test. Um, and as always, it is open to you and to all members, everyone that sits here, to participate, contribute, call me, um, send the recommendation, and perhaps we can invite you to even see a mock trial of what that testing would be so you can get a chance to, to give some feedback before we actually implement it. I would actually like that. Um, in terms of the, the deficiencies, uh, the, the no one left behind policy that we have adopted in this overseas employment program speaks directly to the indication of the deficiencies, not as a tool to only help the candidate or to help the member of parliament or any other, because uh, candidates are not just recommended to us by members of parliament. Members of parliament, councillors, um, we have other groups including agricultural groups, church groups that also provide selections um, of persons that are considered. Uh, but we have adopted that policy, uh, Member Robinson, uh, with the particular hope that anyone that gets that opportunity to be nominated, uh, Member Montague, as one of the persons on your nomination form, that we will be able to either provide them with an opportunity for them to be considered and successful in going overseas or divert them to some other successful pathway once they have the determination and the desire to take up the opportunity. So we have said that before, uh, that we are pursuing uh, uh, the memorandum of understanding with heart, with the perspective that those persons who do not make it to Canada or to the USA, but have an interest and have the competence, they will be able to say, all right, if it is the lack of ability to read that made you not eligible, then let us put you in a reading program. If it is the lack of understanding of um, farming that made you um, ineligible, let us help you with that. We don't want to send persons back. If you have the attitude to do the work, 
but you don't have the competence, we're going to help you to build up that competence. And whatever the deficiency is, the no one left behind policy is geared towards addressing that frontally. In terms of the male specificity in our request, uh, Member Phillips, it is to be clear, as you know, and as we all know, uh, the specific opportunities, whether male or female, or even in the type of farm work, is dependent not on the Jamaican government, not on you or I, but on the employer in Canada or the US that makes the call for our cohort. Uh, what we have found, as I have announced before in this house, is that in recent times, uh, there are several challenges and issues, not just specific to our attitude or, or our conduct, but simply even issues in terms of weather and other things taking place in, other, in our partner jurisdictions that have caused uh, the reduction in opportunities in some areas. One of the areas happens to be in the opportunities for females in the agricultural program. And that is something which we have indicated before. So the, the reasoning behind the male specific requirement is because when we look on the pool that we have now of females that have already been interviewed, already been uh, verified, if you want to use that word, they are sufficient or in excess when it comes on to the opportunities that now exist. That, however, should be understood in the context of the several efforts that we are making as a government to target and to expand those opportunities. So we're not sitting back and saying, well, there are less opportunities for women, so no cards. No. We acknowledge the reality. We express that to the country. We are, we're working within that reality. But we are doing everything we can to build relationships to see if we can um, enhance and expand opportunities for women in the agricultural program. While we also recommend to our females to make sure that they look on the hospitality program as a very good opportunity. Even though the hospitality program is capped, once you have the certificate and the experience we encourage you to send in your resume so that when we get the calls which are not as perhaps systematic as the agricultural um, program sometimes you may get a call in january you may get a call in may you may get a call in november but when we get the calls we want to have a strong pool of jamaican candidates male and female who have the competence, the certification, and the experience in the range of opportunities there are in the hospitality sector so that we can send you um, for that program. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. Just, just a few, just two questions, and it just came out of the question that was asked. Um, I am a little worried minister and i'm looking at it from a, a gender point of view we have been encouraging female farmers mm -hmm. um we boast that we have good female farmers and i'm now hearing that they should be probably somewhere else you're talking about hospitality and they always like to box women in these areas each time you venture into areas that is not really the norm, you hear that you must go back to where you belong. Now, I have a serious issue in terms of, we used to have this strawberry, and it's very, it's a discrimination. I want to put it, ex whether it is external or it... The question has been asked. Um, Minister, are you following me? I would like to find out from you, Minister, in terms of the, and I noticed that there is a, some gag order put up 
that you can't say nothing in here. I do not know where to go, what to say, and where to say. Come on. And we need to stop. Um, um, minister, there used to be a four, um, for the past four years, I remember they said they need specific weight, specific height for females for the strawberry program. And I think about, I don't know if I remember getting even one. But the weight is, I think, is between 100 pounds to 110 pounds. 130? Well, I, I was told 110. However, Minister, what happened to that program? And I would love to hear from you what happened, what do we say to our female farmers who are doing so well in this country? Minister, before you respond, members, I just want to read from the standing order once more. Members, I will always listen to you when you have the floor. Whilst I have the floor, I'm asking you to give the respect. This blue book here is a standing orders that governs Parliament. And so, at section 11A, statement by ministers, Subsection 1 reads, a statement by a minister shall not exceed 12 minutes in duration and shall be limited to matters which directly relate to the subject or department with the responsibility for which he has been charged or which are of urgent or national importance. Section 2, a response to the statement by a minister shall not exceed five minutes in duration and shall be made by the relevant opposition spokesperson. Section three, any member may pose a question on a statement by a minister in accordance with standing order 17 subsection two. I am just asking, I am just asking Members, members, this is, not, this is not up for discussion. The standing order is what governs us. The, time, the, the, timing, the timing is by my discretion. I am saying to you, rather than going to the lengthy presentation, ask a question directly. Just a brief comment on your remark. Mr. Speaker, we do acknowledge that that discretion is reserved for the speaker. And you are asking us to be very um, compliant with the provision of the st standing order. And that is good. But we'll just ask, Mr. Speaker, that you're seeking for compliance. It, across, it applies across the board. Such as duration, may, may I finish, Mr. Speaker? Such as duration, which you point out how long the speaker may speak for. And secondly, what is of concern to us in shaping our questions from time to time is like we are being dictated how to shape our own questions. I don't know if there, is a, if there is a template that you wish to give for all of us to structure our question in. No more than 10 words, etc. And I just want to point those out, Mr. Speaker. We do respect your, your, uh, your duty of discretion, but it must be uniform. It is, it is uniform. It goes right across the board. 
And I'm also, you want to understand and you would realize that I give latitude as much as possible. But please, please, take into consideration. Take into consideration. That's all I'm simply saying. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am, I am extremely happy to see the interest um, that the discussion around the program has elicited. And I'm also very, very, very pleased to see that we're getting questions. I want to thank the member from St. Catherine Eastern for her question because it gives a very good opportunity to provide clarity and certainty to the country. Because many persons, many, many persons actually think in the same way. And so it's an important thing to ventilate. Because the reality is, member, that when we speak about less women going on the program, sometimes people may have the belief that it is the government of Jamaica or you and I as members of parliament that dictate that. We don't have that control. It's a matter of demand and supply. And the demand comes from the employer. If the employer is making more requests, then you will have more opportunities. If the employer makes less requests, then you cannot force or compel them to take more persons. So what we have to do and what we are doing in Jamaica is where we have seen a decrease in the request specific to the farms that were taking large amounts of our women, um, we aren't going to sit back and just say, well, I saw it go. We are providing opportunities for those women that have been displaced to go into other areas. While, while at the same time, we are providing and encouraging and building confidence and better relations between ourselves and employers to either reinstate or to identify new and emerging opportunities for both male and female workers. As to whether an employer has a preference for a male or a female worker, that is a matter of their own determination. We here in Jamaica as a government, or you and I as members of parliament, don't have that control. So I really thank you for the question because it gets an opportunity for us to clarify. And I hope, I hope that you understand. Member from Central Westmoreland. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, uh, as it relates to the hospitality programs, um, I noticed over the years we have not gotten any application forms as it relates to the hospitality program. Um, and and um, that is of a concern. Other from that, Minister, I know of some female farmers who went over. And uh, at this time, they got a call to say that the farm is closed. How those female farmers get to go back on the program? And uh, another question is that, um, remember we have that meeting um, in January of this year, where we have that consultation meeting. Um, I make a recommendation that um, the age is from 21 to 45. But, um, I'm asking for or suggesting that the age from 45 could go to 47, if that being considered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as Minister, just 
turn the mic. There we go. Thank you. Um, as it relates to the hospitality program, uh, member, we it is operated in a different way because unlike the agricultural program, um, you get staggered request and for those programs several times the employers will come in and do their own direct um, interviews however we are in the process of streamlining that program more uh, with the view of being able to announce to the country um, something that will provide more clarity what I can say to you now is that we encourage persons who have an interest in the hospitality program to get certified and get the experience. It's not one, it's both. Because what happens is many persons go and get the certification uh, and then think that that alone is sufficient. So we are actually trying to put together a program that will work with heart and work with hotels and other, other institutions to provide some short to medium term job placement opportunities for persons who have an interest in going on the program. Well, that's something that we will announce. Um, as it relates to the farm being closed, um, what you said a while ago actually confirms what I have been saying. Without me going into the detail, there are farms that for reasons beyond our control are either closed or they are transitioning into something out of agriculture or they have determined on their own that they have a preference for something else or for another jurisdiction or whatever the reason is. But it is up to the employer if they want to continue their business. And once they have closed, what we do is we ensure as best as possible at the first instance that those women or men are placed in whatever opportunities are immediately available. If there are no opportunities available, we put them back into the pool of individuals from which we select, and they are given preference because of their experience and because of the circumstances um, when it comes on to the new opportunities that will emerge. So that's really why we spoke about looking towards alternatives for um, for the, the workers. In, in relation to the age, so we actually did assess that issue based on the recommendation you made um, and we found that there is merit actually in possibly increasing the age but that that should be triggered by an increase in opportunities. So what we wouldn't want to do is then end up increasing the age and us having more people waiting and having frustration. Because that is one of the major issues that we here face. Persons getting card, getting interviewed, sit down, waiting one, two, three, four, five years. So uh, it's something that we're looking on. But as we improve our service, improve relations, and encourage and expand, then we can look to expanding the age cohort. Yeah, just a follow-up, Minister, because the, I, I, I heard your response about the request not coming from the farm owners in Canada for female. But in the years gone by, from I've been elected in this house, used to get for packaging, the strawberry program. Is there an issue why and what, is it, what are the issues surrounding why it is that there is no longer a request for females on the farm program. And we have to be careful also, Minister, on the narrative that, 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 that we leave out there. When we tell females to go and get training in housekeeping, um, because in preparing themselves, because you and I know that there's a cap on the U.S. program. The, 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 the housekeeping generally comes from the U.S. program. You, the last time a request was made of us, members of parliament, we sent in names, but those individuals are still here. So when we build an expectation, when there is actually no, no recruitment from the employers, the pressure comes back to our office. 
and it is said that there's a program out there that the minister says that is out there and that we are selecting only a few when there's none. <laughs> it is a similar situation, minister, that when there is no recruitment taking place on, on the farm work, persons go to the Ministry of Labour and they are sent back to the, the MP's office. We have asked on numerous occasions that that is dealt with, but it still remains. What, if you were listening, you would have heard the questions before. What are the specifics in why it is that the female program, where the com Canadian aspect of it, why is it that for the last four or, or more years that there has not been any at all? Because I am sure that the, the other farms that are employing, the farms employing in Canada, are employing females. Why not Jamaican females? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member for the question. It gives an opportunity for us to provide clarity. So let me firstly and categorically state that I never said, and it is actually very untrue to say that uh, Canada is not accepting Jamaican females. There are hundreds of Jamaican female... Let's hear me hundreds of Jamaican female workers right now in Canada and several who will be going to Canada. Matter of fact, I can tell you without naming specific farms that in one farm, when you look on the numbers from 2022 to 2023, there was a reduction in number of females they had on that farm by 25. In another farm, in the same Canada, you had an increase by 26. So the point I'm making, and I want members to be very clear, listen so you can understand, is that we, you and I, have no control over the business plan of a Canadian employer. They are the ones who determine if they stay in agriculture, if they take more males or females, or if they take persons uh, from Jamaica or from another jurisdiction. What we do is we assess and we analyze. And the facts are showing us that in aggregate, when we put everything together, the numbers of opportunities for our female farm workers has been reduced year on year. Some years it may go up, some years it may go down. But for us, when it goes down, the reason why you don't see new persons coming on the program is the same example I gave to a member from Westmoreland. When a lady or when a female or a male is displaced, they then become first in the pool. So if you had 800 female workers in Canada last year and it goes down by 200, whenever opportunities come back up, those 200 are the first to get the opportunity. So it may mean that the new ones who were interviewed and have not gone may say, well, why am I not going on the program? The program is shutting. No. It's just that we are trying to ensure that those displaced persons um, are put back into the program first. However, the solution is what we're moving to as a government. And the solution to this is to build relations, to encourage more opportunities for Jamaicans. Minister, and to yeah. You have to wrap up now, please. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And to make sure that we provide alternatives for those persons who have been displaced. And those are the three things that we have said we are doing. House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the statements by ministers, we will now have a statement by the most honorable Andrew Holness, Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to update our nation on the pervasive and deliberating drought that we are currently experiencing. 
It is important for this honorable house to be informed and to share an up-to-date assessment uh, and projections from the Meteorological Service, the Water Resources Authority, and the National Water Commission. Madam Speaker, I will also outline the government's response to this pressing challenge facing our nation, both as it relates to our emergency response and our longer-term plans to build water resilience as we contend with a rapidly changing climate. The devastating impact of drought on our people, communities, economy, and environment is a focus of my administration, and your government is working to reduce the impact on the nation. Mr. Speaker, though all of Jamaica is aware, for the purpose of Hansard, it is important to state that Jamaica is in the throes of a meteorological, hydrological, and agricultural drought. To remind colleagues, a meteorological drought happens when dry weather patterns dominate a particular geographic area. A hydrological drought occurs when low water supply becomes evident, especially in streams, reservoirs, and groundwater levels. And this usually follows a meteorological drought. So after a period of no rain, then the natural storage and man-made storage runs low. And therefore, we then say we are in a hydrological drought. You observe this in rivers and streams drying up. And then, Mr. Speaker, we have the agricultural drought, and this happens when crops are visibly affected by the lack of rain or irrigation from stored sources. So we are, we are in the full throes of an all-out drought, hydrological, meteorological, and agricultural. And I don't know if we have displays. The parched earth and burnt hillsides bear witness to the severity of the crisis. There is no parish that has been spared, but the western end of the island has been disproportionately affected. The toll it has taken on our agricultural communities is immeasurable, with livelihoods lost and futures uncertain. But let us be clear, this is not just a crisis of agriculture, it is a crisis of humanity. Behind the statistics and economic losses are the faces of our citizens grappling with the hardship that lack of water presents, grappling with the inconvenience. Uh, as one person pointed out to me uh, yesterday, it is the most difficult thing for our parents not to be able to send their children to school simply because they have no water to provide for the domestic needs. And that is indeed a situation that is repeated right across the country. Jamaica's current conditions are characteristic of the traditional dry season which would normally run from December to April each year. Based on normal patterns, the period of lowest rainfall usually occurs in March, after which conditions gradually improve to a secondary peak in May, and then the primary peak is usually expected in October. I was hoping that I would have the slide showing what our peak patterns of rainfall would be. We have two peaks, one in May and one in October. One driver of climate conditions in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean is the El Nino phenomenon, 
which is usually characterized by reduced rainfall and increased temperatures in the Caribbean region. During 2023, the Earth experienced a strong El Nino, which has been gradually weakening since the start of 2024. Its impact, however, is still being felt in the rainfall patterns of the wider Caribbean and other regions across the world. Relating to the rainfall trend consequent on the El Nino and other factors, in October 2023, Jamaica experienced below normal rainfall during the primary rainfall month of October. This impacted primarily the western parishes of St. James, Hanover, West Ballon, and St. Elizabeth, as well as southern parishes of Clarendon, St. Thomas, Kingston and St. Andrew, and even Manchester. In November, things improved a little, but Hanover, Trelawney uh, continued to experience less than normal rainfall. Conditions showed further improvement in December, with St. James and Hanover experiencing slightly below normal rainfall, while other western parishes were above normal rainfall with their rainfall accumulations. January's rainfall, that is January of this year, showed that the island was then starting to really express dry season characteristics with all parishes recording below normal rainfall. And this was forecast at the time to continue through to April 2024. In February, the trend continued of below normal rainfall for all parishes, with West Ballon receiving 57% of normal rainfall projection and Hanover getting 56% of its normal rainfall projection. So the images that we are now displaying shows the comparison between what was experienced and what is normal for February. What you are seeing now is what we are experiencing. You are seeing a, a, a heat map. I, I don't have the specific ranges for the various colors displayed on the legend on the graph, but a heat map is an intensity of an event. So the deeper, darker colors show the greater intensity. What is clear is that the entire island is dry. Some members might interpret that otherwise. But, but that's that, what, you know, you, Mr. Speaker, that is what happens. That is what happens. That is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that is what you call. No, hold on. That, 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 is, that is what you call a harbinger. A, a sign of, of what, what the future would hold if certain things materialize. <laughs> but as we depart from this light moment, you're now seeing, uh, Mr. Speaker, what the mean is, meaning the mean rainfall, as defined between February 1971 to February 2000. So this is what the average rainfall would look like historically. So February is a dry month, no, no question about that. But this is what it would look like. We would have, uh, in the northeastern parishes, we would have significant rain and precipitation mild, not severe um, conditions, and of course, Kingston and St. Andrew, Clarendon, would usually have severe droughts in, in February. But if we could go back to the previous slide, this is the current situation. So we are really in, we have departed from what is normal. We are actually in a, a very abnormal uh, period for, for February, which is, most of the island is in severe to extreme drought. Based on the low level of rainfall being experienced during March 
2024, the drought conditions are expected to get worse and becoming more severe for those parishes that are already seeing the deficit in rainfall. So parishes such as Hanover, West Milan, St. Elizabeth, Clarendon, Manchester, it is going to get, it's, go, it's going to become even more difficult until we start to, to break that lack of rain, which we expect uh, in, in May we will start to see some rain. So the outlook for rainfall as Jamaica transitions from the dry season to the rainy season, and I, I, I don't know if we have the graph showing this, the rain cycles, if we could go back a few showing the, the rain cycles so that members could understand where our rainfall, when our rainfall takes place during the year. Oh, that is not coming. All right. So the outlook as Jamaica transitions from the dry season to the rainy season shows some hope of above normal rainfall values for mainly southern uh, and central parishes with northern and central and eastern parishes also looking as though they would experience near normal rainfall. Western parishes, on the other hand, including West Berlin and Hanover, are showing a 40 to 50 percent likelihood of a continued drying trend. So the graph that we are now seeing, it's, it is showing the probability of rain between this month, April, May, and June, when we are expecting that we will have one of our rainfall peaks. So the colors uh, that are more uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask that um, Prime Minister be allowed sufficient time to complete his presentation. The rec Those, the, the, the request is on the floor. Those in favor? Aye. Those against, the eyes have it. You may continue, Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members, including the, the members of the, the opposition who seem as if they, they, they would not want my presentation. <laughs> All right, so, Mr. Speaker, the graph being presented, as I was explaining, shows the probability of rainfall during our, our one of our peak months for rainfall. It is showing that the probability for rain in West Milan and Hanover continues to be below 50%, in fact, uh, below 40% probability that they will have rain. Uh, the rest of the island is in the... 40 to 45 percent, which is, which is still not good, but better than uh, a below 40 percent. Uh, and some, of, some areas show above 50 percent. Uh, thankfully, Clarendon uh, and Manchester shows that they will have uh, good probability for rain. So, Madam Speaker, we are expecting that the drought conditions will ease after the, Mr. forgive me, Mr. Speaker, that the drought conditions will ease uh, in another four weeks or so. Mr. Speaker, the NWC has implemented various operating strategies to minimize the negative effects due to the reduction in source yields caused by the reduced rainfall. It is not unusual at this time for major storage facilities in the east of the country to show reduced stored volumes without measurably affecting service to customers in the corporate area. The Hermitage Dam and the Mona Reservoir are currently at 79.1% and 77% respectively of their capacity. 
During last year's historic drought at this time, both were 40 and 54 percent respectively below their capacity. So, Mr. Speaker, whilst the rest of the country is severely affected, uh, thankfully Kingston and St. Andrew has not been so badly affected. This is due primarily to the NRW, the National uh, Waste Reduction in, in Water, Water Loss Reduction, Revenue Loss Reduction. So we have less leaks, which means that our storage capacity uh, is usually higher because there's less water going out of the system for which we are unaware are not being able to account for. So our storage is higher. But we have also put in uh, new systems that uh, would be feeding into some of our storage. Uh, and the general management of the water resource, the potable water resource, has improved. So we are able, within Kingston and St. Andrew, to have, a, within the corporate area, a higher level of resilience to drought. We need to build this resilience across the, the island. At the other end of the island, however, the Logwood water supply system that serves Negril and environs in both Hanover and Westmoreland is currently receiving only 50% of its normal yield. So that's much worse than last year. The other affected systems by parish, and I will go through them in some detail so that it is on the record and the country understands the challenges that we face. And I, I pointed out specifically that Negril and Westmoreland, they are now 50% 40 and 54 percent respectively uh, below what their capacity should be. And that explains largely why the, the people of Negril are so badly affected. And I want to say here, Mr. Speaker, that we hear the cries, we hear the complaints. Uh, I dispatched Minister Samuda to go down and meet with stakeholders, he did, and uh, we mobilized almost all the trucking resources of the NWC to focus on the Negril area. We are putting resources there, and uh, we are hopeful that we can uh, keep the response going for the next four weeks so that uh, the people of Negril can have at least some convenience in this very difficult time. So just for the record, I will read for the parish of St. Andrew, there are 12 water systems affected. These are, would, would be the Bucky Plain, they are at 30% of operations. Isaac Hole, 40% of their operating capacity. Alban Hill, Rock Hall, 60%. Magowan Spring, 50%. Barnet Wood, 60%. Belboa, 50%. Belmore, 60%. King Weston, 70%. Mahoney, 60%. Rosehill, 40%. Orchard Spring, 25%, and a place called Second Breakfast. I don't know what kind of name this is, but this is the name of a water supply system. They are at 70%. In, in St. Thomas, six systems are affected. Art, Art Nolly Grove, 70% of their capacity. Erie Castle is at 50%. Trinityville, which serves a large area, is 40% of their capacity. Needham Penn is at 50% of their capacity. Wilmington is at 20% of their capacity, and Lando is at 70% of capacity. In St. Mary, Castleton is at 80%, not doing too badly. But Crescent is at 50% of its capacity. Gale Spring is at 60% of its capacity. Lucky Hill is at 70% of capacity. Platteville at 50% of capacity. Rock Spring, 60% of capacity. Fellowship at 70% of capacity. Palmetto Grove, 50% of capacity. Sandhill, 60% of capacity. Bonnygate, 75% of capacity. And Itoboreal Spring, that is at zero. Itoboreal, that's the proper pronunciation. That is in South East St. Mary. Uh, that's the, the spring has dried up, essentially. The, the well still has some water, but we have to be very careful with it because once the spring that supplies it has dried up, it's, 
you, you, you run the risk of not only emptying the well, but damaging the pump and the supply. But we are in almost at the final stages of developing the Jordan well, which will alleviate some of the problem in, in that area. In Portland, Windsor Forest is at 20% of its capacity. Norwich is at 75% of its capacity. Turtle Crawl is at 60% of its capacity. And Packy River is at 30% of its capacity. In St. Anne, Dawson Town water system is at 20% of its capacity. Higgins Town, 50% of its capacity. Content, 15%. New Hope, 25%. Cascade, 50%. And Macney, 50%. In St. Catherine, the gold mine plant is at 60% of its capacity and thankfully uh, the, the other systems in St. Catherine so far have not been affected. Uh, in Clarendon, seven systems are affected, Anian Town, 20% of its capacity, Rock River, 60% of its capacity, Drummond Spring, 35% of capacity, Patterson Spring, 60% of capacity, Peace River, 60% of capacity, New Ground, 80% of capacity, and Low Ground, 30% of capacity. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for systems in the western end of the island, the affected sources would be in St. James, the Cambridge Water Treatment Plant is at 50% of its capacity, Mafuta is at 50% of its capacity, Endeavour is at 50% of its capacity, Niagara is at 50% of its capacity, Vaughan Field at 50% of its capacity, and Tangle River at 40% of its capacity. So, yeah, so South St. James, and, and it would also have a bleed over into, into West Central and into East Central. So those areas would be affected. In Trelawney, the Troy water system, Troy and New Hope, that would be 40% of its capacity. Wilson Run, 20% of its capacity. Ulster Spring, 20% of its capacity. The Queen of Spain, one, three, and four, they are at, well, one and four, in, those are in Trelawney, uh, would be at about 75% of capacity. And one of them, I understand, is actually out of operation. So Trelawney will be affected, but it's, it's, it's not as widespread because only five systems. Um, in Manchester, Moravia, 50% of their capacity, that's what they can, can do. They, in fact, they only operate for 12 hours daily because they, they just don't have enough water to pump consistently. And Cowick Park Spring, they are at 75%. That's in your constituency. Um, and they operate, well, no, I, I, I've read that incorrect. They are at 25% of capacity, forgive me. They are 25% of capacity, and they can only pump for six hours of the day. Um, in Hanover, the logwood system treatment plant, that they're down to 50% of capacity. Uh, New Mills, they're at 65% and Kendall is at 50%. Uh, in Westmoreland, the Bullstrode water treatment plant, they are only at 80% uh, of capacity. So in total, 64 systems island-wide are affected. And uh, on average, most systems are between uh, 40 and 50% of capacity. So that's, that's a significant impact on the ability of the country to produce and therefore distribute water in its utility systems and um, ancillary systems. So there is no doubt that the impact of the drought is extensive and that the impact on the NWC is not only extensive, but deep. So what will be the government's response? Drought is not a new phenomenon in Jamaica, but the severity and frequency of recent droughts demand a concerted and comprehensive response. We cannot simply wait for the rains to come. We must act decisively to support those affected and build resilience for the future. Mr. Speaker, your government is doing just that. First and foremost, our response must be grounded in empathy and compassion for those enduring the hardship of drought. To the farmers and rural communities on the front line of this crisis, I give my unwavering commitment to stand by your side and provide the assistance you need to survive and indeed recover and thrive.
from this drought. That is why the government is implementing a range of measures to support our farmers during these challenging times. This includes the emergency funding, which we will put in place in the amount of $150 million for the trucking of water and procurement and distribution of a limited amount of water tanks. And let me just explain that, Mr. Speaker, we will make an emergency allocation of 150 million Jamaican dollars. Most of this will go towards the trucking of water. We will keep a small reserve where we see we need to have emergency procurement of water tanks. The government already has in place a water tank program, so we're not going to replicate. But the water tank program must, because it's such a, a large program, it must go through all the processes and we are now at the final stage of procurement. So we should be at a point where we can distribute tanks. So we wouldn't want to replicate. Only if we identify that there is an emergency situation, then out of this 150, we would look at um, supporting sometimes. I'll, I'll come to that later in this presentation. So initial, initially, Mr. Speaker, we will give each, well, let me, let me be clear on this. The last time we did this emergency intervention for the drought, we only focused on the parishes that were assessed as being impacted, which meant that we were able to uh, be more meaningful with the resources that was made available. We continue to use this kind of assessment tool. We assess that there are 50 constituencies that are impacted. As I had shown you the map, the impact is island-wide. But if you look at the corporate area, including in Portmore, there are areas that are not affected by drought. They may be affected by other things, but they are not affected by drought because they, as we pointed out, for example, the storage capacity at Hermitage and Mona are up at 70%. So we want to make sure that the resources that we have are targeted to the areas that are really in need. So there, there are 13 constituencies which will not benefit from this distribution of resources, but 50 constituencies will. I'm, I'm not going to name all the constituencies. So, so yeah, there are some constituencies that, that, don't, that don't, to be fair, they don't, they don't need it. No, but I'm, I'm coming to the tax. Right. So, so we, we, I, I think the way in which we are doing it is the most economical way, focusing on the, the areas that really need it. So for those 50 constituencies, they will get 1.5 million for trucking. And I, I can say that the constituencies are all that will get this. Most, if not all of them, are rural. So it's, it's really the rural constituencies that will, that will get it. Uh, there might be a few in the St. Andrew era, but then those are considered as rural as, as well. No, this, this, this is not, I, well, I'll, I'll come to that in the, in the presentation. But for Clarendon, we will give Clarendon Southwest, Southeast, Central, Northwest, North Central, North, an additional $2.5 million. And the municipal corporation will get $5 million. And, and the reason why we do it this way is that um, the municipal corporation, there is an intervention that comes through the NWC and through MPs. But the NWC's intervention 
is limited to precisely it's limited to their to their utility um, customers people who are customers of the NWC or to critical public installations schools hospitals police station government offices and so forth but then as we know there are many communities that are informal settlements they don't get their water through a utility service and there are also many customers who get water from ancillary services they, they get water from a local system from uh, entombment of a, a small river or a spring or a catchment and those might also be running dry so we give an allocation to the parish council for trucking to be able to reach those communities that are not on the utility network. So in St. Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth Northeast, St. Elizabeth Northwest, St. Elizabeth Southeast, St. Elizabeth Southwest, we'll get those constituencies will be allocated an additional 2.5 million on top of the 1.5 that they would normally get. And uh, the municipal corporation will get $5 million. In West Mullen, West Mullen Central, West Mullen East, West Mullen West, those constituencies will get 2.5 additional, and the municipal corporation will get $5 million. In Hanover, Hanover East, and Hanover West, same 2.5 million additional, but we will give the municipal corporation $7.5 million, uh, spe specifically to assist within the Negril area where the, the issues there are significant. Uh, in St. Anne, St. Anne Northwest will get 2.5 million and the Municipal Corporation will get 7.5 million. Um, so we will have reserve of 5 million and that reserve we will use to treat with the 13 constituencies that are not given an allocation but if an, an emergency were to arise or the Member of Parliament is able to point out that there is a specific community that needs some service, then from that five million we would be able to respond over the next four weeks. Corporate yes, corporate area. Yeah. So, so I think the way in which we have approached it, Mr. Speaker, is fair, given the nature of the, the, the problem. There is a reality that this funding will not do everything, and I want to stress that. Uh, one, one member of parliament pointed out to me when I was discussing this that whenever I come to parliament and make these announcements, the constituents believe that the world has been given to the member of parliament. And I, I want to say that $150 million is not enough. It cannot solve the problem entirely. However, it is what we are able to do right now, and it is for a short period of time as we expect that we will get rainfall starting the end of April into May. So for the, we are really making this as a budgetary arrangement for the next four weeks. So that, that's at the end of four weeks, we expect that the drought conditions will ease. I wish to assure the citizens of West Berlin and Hanover, particularly Negril and Environs, that we will continue beyond this allocation if, as projected, dry conditions persist into the summer. So again, Mr. Speaker, if the projected rainfall does not ease the condition, then I should be back here with a, a further allocation to ensure that our citizens can have some support. It is also important that I note the impact on the citizens in Brownstone. And Mr. Speaker, I must point out that they have been very patient and very understanding. Uh, their situation is not so much caused by the drought conditions, but uh, there was a failure of a main system in fact one of their pumps went down and uh, uh, and the collapse of of 
of a well. Um, but we are now, Mr. Speaker, uh, quite advanced in making the corrections to, to that problem. In fact, during this period, the NWC made a 30, we, we provided for the NWC $30 million to support the trucking and provision of water to the residents of Brownstone. I know that is no comfort having been with water for so long, but it's important that the country knows that an important town like Brownstone was without water. They weren't just left. The, the government made several interventions, including the provision of trucking of water, and we are quite advanced in finding a solution to the problems there. I also wish to note that the parishes of St. Elizabeth and Clarendon have also received additional support from the government as they have been affected. And Mr. Speaker, these measures should not be contemplated as the sole response based upon portable water. The Ministry of Local Government Mr. Speaker, is giving support to several communities. Uh, in fact, they have allocated $100 million for trucking, and indeed the parish councils are themselves uh, giving support for trucking to communities that have been affected. But as I said, Mr. Speaker, the response is not just for potable water. The Ministry of Agriculture has been, Mr. Speaker, very active in providing water to our farmers. So, a number of farming communities have benefited. The Ministry of Agriculture and a team from RADA have made significant effort in supporting several communities in Clarendon, St. Elizabeth, Manchester, and Trelawney. Uh, these are the parishes that have been most affected by drought conditions, agricultural drought conditions. The Ministry of Agriculture has a now well-established system of mitigating drought, and uh, they have started the trucking of water to the parishes of St. Elizabeth and Manchester through the Rural Agricultural Development Authority. And uh, they have also started to provide more water supply through the National Irrigation Commission. And during the period January to March 2024, over 9 million gallons of water have been trucked to approximately 900 farmers to alleviate the impact of the dry spell. The ministry has also distributed 9,000 square meters of pond liners with 45 recipients benefiting from that. These farmers are now able to better harvest their crops and use the limited and intermittent rainfall that they have received. The NIC has also distributed 44 650 gallon tanks, 14 1,000 gallon tanks, and 400 12 millimeter reels of drip hoses. So that's significant assistance to our farmers in this time of great need in the drought. I have instructed the Minister of Agriculture to ramp up the program as we enter into the heights of our dry season. And the Ministry has earmarked $60 million to treat with the trucking of water provision of additional drip irrigation support uh, and other support for our livestock farmers. So, Mr. Speaker, the government is responding on all fronts to the drought. I wanted to point out briefly, Mr. Speaker, that we would have seen in the news where a water tank was stolen from the Negril Primary School. All I can say about that, Mr. Speaker, is that this is despicable. Despicable. 
in a period where the country is grappling with this national crisis. Someone would seek to deprive a school of its water storage capacity. I urge the police to investigate it thoroughly and recover the tank and bring the perpetrators to justice. The, the rural water supply company has done several projects with our schools, uh, including building storage tanks. Some, some very innovative uh, architectural designs were used to incorporate stairwells and turn stairwells into storage tanks. So having seen this come upon my radar again, Mr. Speaker, I have given directions that the Rural Water Supply Limited partner with the Ministry of Education to do a national assessment of our schools to see what capacity they have, what facilities they could have that we could create water storage for them. We urge schools, Mr. Speaker, to plan in their operations for water resilience. Let me say this, Mr. Speaker. In the era of climate change, whenever you're doing your business plan, you have to think continuity of operations. What happens if there is a catastrophic break in normalcy? So if you are a manager of any significant operation, any significant plan, you make provisions for security, you make provisions for human resource management, you make provisions for administration and accountability. If it is a school, you make definitely your provisions for teaching and learning. You make provisions for stakeholder integration and involvement. You must make plans for climate-related issues. So when you're doing your national, your year plan, you must budget. And when you're doing your infrastructure plan as to, it's not only classrooms you need to build, we need to think about storage. So what we have asked the Rural Water Supply Company to do is to partner with the Ministry of Education to assist our schools in developing their water resilience plans, which would also include how we develop infrastructure or how we can repurpose existing infrastructure to become water capture, storage, and distribution within our schools. Because the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that for the foreseeable future, we cannot rely on the normal operations and rely on predictable weather that we are going to have um, uninterrupted utility supply of water. So in the foreseeable future, every agent, every department, every company, every ministry must have a plan as to how you will survive. And for our education system, uh, we need to start that planning. So we have asked the Rural Water Supply Company and the Ministry of Education to work together. And it is important that we start there because the new generation of Jamaicans, the new Jamaicans growing up, we need to have this mindset. You know, Mr. Speaker, when I was growing up, conservation was an important thing. And I'm sure most of us in this parliament, you were told, don't leave the the show are running. Turn the lights off. Somehow I see a generation growing up where conservation is not a priority. And I think we, we, we have to start that now. And uh, so the, the collaboration between Rural Water and the Ministry of Education is not just about the infrastructure. It is also about developing this conservation mindset for 
not just water, but also for energy. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, our response must be broader than just the temporary trucking of water. And I point out, Mr. Speaker, that we have been able to withstand this severe drought in Kingston largely because we have improved the water infrastructure and water management in the corporate area. Largely because of that. But we continue, Mr. Speaker, to make massive investments in our water infrastructure. And I want to just point out to the country a few of them. The National Water Commission will make, in this coming fiscal year, $5 billion. $5 billion of capital works in water. This will benefit 165,000 Jamaicans. Additionally, we will spend more than $2.5 billion in the sewage infrastructure. And the Rural Water Supply Limited will get the largest allocation in our history of $1.6 billion to deal with rural water supply right across Jamaica. The the second largest allocation that rural water has ever received was $800 million by this administration in 2018. So we have doubled it because we intend to make an impact right across the island for communities that have been deprived of this valuable commodity. Just so that we are aware, because Sometimes the conversation focuses on what is not done. And it is as if nothing is being done. So I, I today, Mr. Speaker, with your indulgence and with the support of the members in the House, especially when you hear investment that is going to improve the quality of life of your constituents to make it known that you are happy for the investment. The Jordan run well. Number three, in Agualta Vale, Richmond, Highgate, and Islington will benefit 37,000 persons, a $160 million investment. Black River, you see what say? 20 years it was supposed to be done. We are getting it done now. Black River, Black River, exchange drive to the town centre pipeline and from town centre to Arlington, the parity pipeline, that's 4,400 persons will benefit, $238 million worth of investment. I, I know the member from Southwest will be very happy. Darnock, water supply. Barren Hill Reservoir replacement, a 200,000 gallon tank will be built there. 11,000 people will benefit, a $20 million investment. The Rock River water supply, the rehabilitation of the existing source and the transmission pipeline. I know the member will be very happy for that. 300,000 persons will benefit, $75 million of investment. The storage tank improvement, water supply installation of the number five um, bolted steel tank for Hope, Mount Erie, Louisville, Happy Grove, and Whitehall. 15,000 persons will benefit. $194 million of investment. Jericho Well, number one, Yorkton to York Street pipeline. 3,000 persons will benefit. $98 million of investment. In Morant Bay, Springfield to Seafort, the Morant Bay upgrading works, 2,200 persons, $3 million worth of investment. South Manchester, water supply, Grove Town, 
to Krosky's mains replacement <clears throat> and upgrading. $210 million of investment. Wakefield Bunkers Hill main upgrade, $20 million worth of investment. A thousand persons will benefit. Boguel to Wilton Crossing in St. Elizabeth. We're going to do main replacements there. $290 million of investment. Christiana, the spoiling water supply, 5,000 people will benefit. $53 million of investment. Christiana, again, Moravia Water Treatment Plant, 4,000 persons to benefit, $70 million of investment. In Constant Spring, the water treatment plant and uh, some other infrastructure work, $50 million of investment. The Essex All Water Supply for St. Andrew, New Works Water Treatment, $190 million of investment. The Jacksonville Water Supply for Harriman, Mountain Spring, and Seaview Transmission Mains. 10,000 persons will benefit $315 million of investment. Juno Crescent Well. And this Juno Crescent, I believe, is Clarendon. 1,500 persons to benefit $220 million of investment. In Magati, it's the Magati to Newtown pipeline, 3,000 persons to benefit, $95 million of investment. The Mount Royal booster station that is in Portmore, $21 million of investment. The Rhine Park water supply and upgrading, 6,000 Persons to benefit, $145 million of investment. Rosemount, Camelot Discovery, that's a water supply upgrade. 3,500 persons to benefit. And that's $120 million of investment. The Santa Cruz water supply, $50 million of investment. The Whitehall to New Market water supply and relief station, 3,000 persons to benefit, $158 million of investment. I was, I was stopped, the, the member from Northwest St. Elizabeth. Uh, I got a message for you from one of your constituents who was pleading about that water supply. And I, I told her that it is on the budget. In fact, it is budgeted and it will start this year. The Greater Mandible Water Supply Program, that continues, $770 million will be spent this year. Again, Mandible is, Manchester is one of the areas, though severely affected, but it has done better in this drought cycle than it has done just for the end of last month. But it, it, has done, it has done fairly better than the last drought. I think we have to admit that. And a large part of that, again, is the building of resilience through, the, through this program of the investment in the great amount of water supply. We, we have a program not just for improvement of infrastructure, but operational efficiency. And uh, that program is an investment of $342 million, that is to improve pumps and power supplies and things like that. We have a transmission main upgrade from Ferry to Rock Pond in St. Andrew, $404 million. In Ferry to Rock Pond, again, a water supply and the installation of the mechanical and engineering works, pumping and so forth, that's $200 million. For the KSA transmission main upgrade, uh, that is Montgomery Corner to the National Hero Circle. That's a big project for us. It's $50 million. And then we have another transmission main program here in Helsha. For the Helsha main road, $50 million to change that transmission main. 
Uh, we have our transmission main upgrade from Roaring River to Runaway Bay, phase one. That's $100 million of investment. So it is clear, I hope, now to the entire Jamaica that the problem of water is a significant one. We don't in any way try to dismiss the concerns raised by our citizens about the lack of water. But that is not the complete story. The complete story is that this government is making consistently the greatest level of investment in replacing and creating new water infrastructure. I don't know if members took note, Mr. Speaker, when I was listing the projects that a number of the projects were for the replacement of water mains. There is a view in our citizenry that when we lay down water infrastructure, it will last forever. That's not the case. Everything has, and especially things that we build, a useful life an engineered life, and much of our water infrastructure has passed its useful life. So the problem, Mr. Speaker, is not just to bring water to new customers or new persons coming onto the system. It is about also maintaining the existing system that was built 50, 60, 70 years ago, for which no investments have been made in any significant way. But this administration has increased the pace of investment. That is to counter the disinvestment that has taken place over the last 40 years and to bring new investment. But last year, amid Jamaica's worst drought, the corporate area was undersupplied in potable water by just under 12 billion gallons daily. We have broken ground for the Rio Cobra water treatment plant in Content St. Catherine. When completed in the next two years, this plant will provide 15 and a half million gallons daily, supporting distribution to the KSA, Portmore, and Spanish Town. This project is at a cost of 78 million US dollars. It is a PPP project, and it will move us closer towards our water sustainability goals for 2030. Madam Speaker, the plans that we have in place for Mr. Speaker, the plans that we have in place for water resilience in the corporate area is taking shape, and you are starting to see the impact of it. And it's not just for drought, Mr. Speaker. It is to be. It is to be able to bring water to underserved communities, communities like in my constituency of West Central St. Andrew and my neighboring uh, members of Parliament, uh, Western and Southwest, where we have unreliable, and not to mention West Kingston and Central Kingston, where the, the water situation there is unimaginable as to how people are able to survive. We have made a big step in putting in the new pipelines, and this pipeline goes as far as and interconnects through uh, East Kingston and Port Royal and actually ends up in Port Royal. So we are making big steps towards supplying the corporate area. So we have put in the pipe. No, we have just broken ground for the supply. And that supply is taking 15 million, 15 and a half million gallons of water from the rear cobra to put into those new pipelines that we have put in. This is what you call a nation building investment. These pipelines will last us for another 50, 60, 70 years. You don't have to worry about that again. What we now have to look at, at Mr. Speaker, are the lateral connections. So there are many communities that have the inch and a half pipes running into their homes, but those pipes, some two inches coming from the main, 
those pipes have now calcified and uh, they, are, they are rotted and so the next step now is to change out those laterals so you will start to see an improvement in, in water flow. I want to spend a little time, Mr. Speaker, on Negril. The Negril Water Improvement Project will see the construction of a 10 million gallon water treatment plant in Roaring River. This is the long-term solution to the water problem there. This will be in Roaring River, West Berlin, at an estimated cost of 20 million US dollars. The structure of the water treatment, the structure of the water treatment process consists of the raw water intake, the spitter box, the sedimentation tanks with the sludge draw system, sand filters, and a backwash unit, and a chlorine contact tank with booster pump, chemical mixing and dosing building, control room and laboratory, office and operation facilities. In addition, there will be a solar farm to power the operations of this plant. So, yes, Mr. Speaker, we hear the cry of the people. We explain that this is not a situation where somehow the government is deliberately depriving people of water. This is a, a naturally occurring event of a drought which happens every year. It is more severe now than before. And therefore, an area like Negril, which is a booming area, a growing area, particularly for tourism, has been disproportionately affected. But the truth is, Mr. Speaker, that the drought aside, Negril was not in a position where it could say that it is resilient in relation to water because it just didn't have the water supply and the distribution infrastructure. What I've just read out here, Mr. Speaker, is going to have a similar impact as the content water project which we have broken ground for. This project will ensure that the Negril area and its environs, indeed the parishes of West Milan and parts of Hanover, will have water resilience. So when there is a drought, they won't have this kind of devastating impact because of lack of water. We're spending 20 million US dollars to deal with that. The overall effectiveness of the intervention at the Roaring River to improve service levels uh, in the extreme western section of the island, particularly in the grill, must be complemented by improvement activities to those systems adjacent to the focal target area. This will ensure the sustainability of the intervention as well as in the medium to long term adequacy of supply to current and future demands. In light of this, the activities to be undertaken as part of this project are contiguous for an effective and long-lasting intervention. I want to assure Jamaicans that we are far advanced in developing other critical national projects. These projects include, but not limited to, the replacement of critical supply mains in Western Jamaica, including the mains from Martha Bray into St. James and the Negril supply lines at a cost of 70 million US dollars. This project is expected to commence later this year and will take 24 months. I don't say a lot about this project, Mr. Speaker. It's part of our Northwest Regional Project. But the pipelines that I have just mentioned, you would describe them as critical national infrastructure. If those pipelines break, almost the entire Montego Bay would be without water including our hotel industry. It's a single pipeline. The pipelines are very old. Some of them are showing signs of collapse. In fact, they have collapsed. Some of them have collapsed and we have had to rehabilitate them. This investment of 70 million US dollars will upgrade and replace in sections some of those mains but it will give us a resiliency in water for St. James, particularly Montego Bay, and parts of Trelawney, parts of Hanover, uh, parts of Westmoreland that we now don't have. So, so I want members to appreciate that, yes, we have the challenges with the drought, 
but the government is taking the long-term decisions to put in the infrastructure to build our resilience in water. 70 million US dollars to improve and replace those pipelines. Mr. Speaker, the redevelopment of the Hermitage Dam. The Hermitage Dam is 95 years old and was built with a guaranteed useful life of 50 years. So we are on borrowed time with the Hermitage Dam. I won't say too much about it. The NWC continues to conduct uh, its engineering exercise to ensure that the dam uh, is structurally sound. Uh, we have seen some signs where there have been some compromise which we, we are concerned about. For example, we are seeing tree roots getting into the base. And that will happen after 95 years. You know, all of that will happen. After 95 years, the dam has really served us well. And it, it is now time to make a massive investment in expanding and improving the dam. So as such, we are in the project design phase for the replacement of the dam wall and the increase in the capacity of the dam. So it is likely that we will build a new dam wall further down, probably a little higher, and that will increase the capacity behind that new dam wall. So we will increase the capacity coming into Kingston and St. Andrew. So that's the, that, so we are on our way to making that massive investment to further guarantee our water resilience. The completion of the project assessment phase for the development of the Mahogany Vale system, which includes the repair of the Yalas pipeline and the expansion of the Mona Reservoir and land use studies. Mr. Speaker, you will recall that I had announced this two budgets ago. Plans are moving apace to have the Mahogany Vale project executed. And the, the pipeline, Mr. Speaker, the Yalas pipeline, again, you call it critical national infrastructure. That is what brings in the bulk of water into the Mona Reservoir, which serves Kingston and St. Andrew. Built in the 80s, it is at its useful life now several leaks, blocked in several places, uh, unregulated settlements around it. All kinds of issues have depleted the capacity of that pipeline. We, we must now reclaim the pipeline, improve it, and uh, we need to, get to, to, to produce more water for the pipeline, which is what the Mahogany Vale development will do. No, you will, the, the Mahogany Vale system will be fear in how it extracts the water and redistributes it. So yes, West St. Thomas and the communities uh, in proximity will benefit. That's how it is being designed. Uh, Madam Speaker. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Colleagues will recall that we are procuring 10,000 black tanks to be distributed this year at a cost of $250 million. This is a part of my commitment to provide 50,000 tanks to Jamaicans. So this is the first phase of that 50,000 tank commitment. Colleagues should also recall that we are midway in the installing of 3,000 residential water harvesting systems across 14 affected constituencies from last year. So there are MPs inside here who, are, who have benefited from the installation of not just tanks, but the connection of tanks to rules for water collection, rainwater harvesting. So Mr. Speaker, it's, it's not just the building out of the, the capital infrastructure. It's also putting in place, uh, helping to develop private capacity to build the resilience of households to the water crisis that we face. Mr. Speaker, why it's not a part of this presentation. The solution to the water problem is not complete unless we contemplate, meaning we give significant consideration to how we protect our water sources. I, I, I have not dealt with that in this presentation. I intend to come back to the House to give further details 
about how we, are, we plan to protect our rivers. And I can tell you specifically, I'll be coming here to give details about our, the, the, the Rio Cobre in particular. We have to protect our watersheds. And I'll be coming here to give more information about what we are doing about watersheds. And Mr. Speaker, we have to develop a comprehensive water resilience strategy which will include a significant public education component. The way in which it is turning out now, based upon the issues that we have to contemplate with climate change and the growing demand for the convenience of having water to your house, in your household, Mr. Speaker, we have to treat water as a critical national resource that we have to protect and manage very carefully. So in closing, drought is a complex and multifaceted challenge that requires a coordinated and sustained response from all levels of the government, the private sector and the community at large. By working together with understanding, empathy, foresight and determination, we can overcome this crisis and build a brighter, more resilient future where all Jamaicans can have access to potable water in a convenient manner. Mr. Speaker and colleagues, I thank you. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Um, Mr. Speaker, let me say that the response is timely um, because there have been a lot of us, especially in the rural parts of Jamaica, where our constituents have been seeing drought conditions from last year. I can speak of Manchester itself, where from October last year, we have been not having regular rainfalls, if not none at all. But while we have been seeing the unpredictability of our weather pattern, as the Prime Minister had shown us the expected rainfalls within the period of when we should expect high rainfall, which is within that year, April, May, and June. Because of the unpredictability in rainfalls, um, Mr. Speaker, and with the resources that has been committed from the Prime Minister to various constituencies, we're still not certain if we're going to see that level of rainfall. And those, we're still not certain. Because we have seen in the past, in the summer months, we have been getting high level of rain. And those areas where we should be getting more rain, we haven't seen any rain at all. Which is why I've mentioned the unpredictability of, our, of, our, of the weather pattern. What is not certain, which did not keep, come out of your presentation, it is how that these resources how is it that it will be accessed by the members of parliament in responding to, when usually it is through the Ministry of Water. And I would hasten to say, I would hasten to say, if it is going through the same process as you just confirmed, yes, those that are going to the members of parliament, is that because in some instances, some of these truckers, the demand from the municipal councils, the NWC, the members of parliament, and how the funds flow, a lot of them wait until the resources are available before. And the demand from the members of parliament of when, the, 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 because in the instance of Manchester, where we are getting $1.5 million per constituency coming out of your presentation, that 
amount of resources can be spent in less than two weeks. In less than two weeks. Because of the distance in some instances of where the water needs to be delivered. That's a more efficient way in how the, 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 the disbursement of the resources can be done. If it is that we have to add more staff, if it is that way. But there has to be a more efficient way so that the, those who are contracted to do the distribution can be, can be done more efficiently on a, on a more um, on-time basis. Prime Minister, the schools, especially in rural, deep rural, and priority has to be given not only to our primary and high schools, but our early childhood institutions. The matter is not that in some instances, I can tell you because I've been getting calls from my own schools, is that they have already exhausted what they have budgeted, and this is the start of this month already, for the delivery of water. I see that you mentioned that a program will be put in place for schools, but that it be, be, be re-looked at, because especially for early childhood institutions, because we are seeing more and more demand out there as members of parliament, and I'm sure the councillors also, for the delivery of water for our schools um, right across the island. In many instances, Prime Minister, you speak about the, the, the $5 billion worth of, of projects that you have announced. Some of these projects are ongoing projects from previous financial years. So, so, so it would be good to get a, 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 an amount of what are new projects starting in this financial year. Because many a times we, we put figures out there when there are some projects that are rolling over just like the Mandeville Greater Water Supply program, Project. But as you mentioned that project, Prime Minister, there's one phase of that project that should have started from July of last year. And I mentioned it um, earlier this year in the House. A second contractor has been contracted for that phase. I got a letter as the Member of Parliament in which the majority of the work will be being done, naming the contractor, but up to now, and that was about three months ago, up to now we have not seen any work on that phase of the project. I mean, just this morning, not knowing that you are coming here to make a statement, I, I call NWC to find out what is the situation with that project. In your statement, you yourself had, have acknowledged that many of the projects that you have announced here for the NWC are rehabilitation projects, replacement. And as a member of parliament of a constituency where less than 40% of the constituencies see portable water. It would be good if we, if, if we see a program in the near future speaking about communities that have no pipes running in those areas and how it is that we can get water too. Because those, while we improve the water supply to those who already have, the black tank program and the delivery of water is only a temporary fix for many Jamaicans. You're doing 40,000 water tanks, and I'm sure there are, there are more than 40,000 Jamaicans out there that have no access to water. So when we have a drought now, there is the, 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 the possibility of them having to, to traverse distance to get water is one that is challenging. And the cost of trucking water, especially in deep rural communities, I know that some of the members of parliament over there. House leader. Yeah, I'm minus five minutes. I just want two more minutes. I agree. You really do. Mr. Speaker. I ask that the member be given five minutes more to complete his comments. Thank you. Question is on the floor. Those in favor?
Those against, the eyes of it. Members, you, member, you may continue, sir. Yes, thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker and House Leader. So, the issue of the water tanks, as I, 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 I was saying before, is a temporary fix to the situation out there. It would be good to get a, a report uh, since the Prime Minister is speaking about these projects. How many projects in communities, be it small, medium, or large, that have no access to water and will actually get some water? It is important for those Jamaicans to know that they are being considered within the, the, the gamut of a budget itself and not just dealing with those and the improvement of those who currently have water and the improvement of those water projects. The announcement of the, the Hermitage and the Mona Dam is timely because I remember in a sectoral presentation by uh, the member from Southwest Clarendon speaking about the importance and the urgency of dealing with those um, the, 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 those two water treatment or catchment uh, for the Kingston and St. Andrew metropolitan area. Because when you look at the capacity now, where one is 75 and one 77, it, what, what they say to us is that the, the capacity is not, we're not seeing the full capacity because of sediment buildup in these um, catchment tank, um, dams. And it, it, it has been of concern for many. We have seen a better, uh, what, what should I say, a better um, management of how it is that the NWC distribute water during the dry periods. Because I can say that last, mo last year, we didn't see that much lock off or the, 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 of those areas that are um, satisfied by those treatment plants. So, Prime Minister, this is just one step. Um, we are hoping that there is an efficient distribution of the, water, of the tanks themselves right across to the 63 constituencies. The last time that we were promised water tanks, there was an issue of the transportation of where it is that we pick up these water tanks. For those in rural Jamaica, had to find resources, which we don't have as members of parliament, because we were not able to use our CDF for the transportation of those water tanks. That, that would be considered, because as I said, this is something that is once announced, our constituents, I'm sure the phones will be ringing at our constituency offices in, in just the demand of individuals who are seeking um, one of these water tanks. But again, Prime Minister, this is just a part of a solution to a bigger problem. And as I asked before, in that next time, in our next iteration, that we consider more communities that have no water. Because you speak of the community of, of Cowick Park in my own constituency. That water catchment tank. Remember, stop. There, there's a echo in sound. Yeah, try the next mic, please. Can you hear me? Yes. That catchment tank, Prime Minister, has been on the books for replacement, I would say, for the last eight years. It is leaking like a sieve. Hence why there is no, that is a Coic Park catchment tank. It is leaking like a sieve. And, and we have been um, advocating with the National Water Commission in when, because it was on a list for replacement and has not been replaced. So there are, there are issues out there, low-hanging fruits. I speak of, of comfort all in my own constituency, Evergreen, that is a part of the same pipe replacement that should have started in Union, from the Union well, some three to four years ago. And that program has not yet. I speak about the, the California to buck up in my own constituency that has been on the books of the NWC for the last three years 
that have, that have been waiting on pipes, just some low-hanging fruits in some communities that have no access to water. And I'm sure that those residents want to hear from us when and how it is that we will be able to give them some water in their communities. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, Prime Minister, is very, very brief. In the document you circulated as member from Northwest Manchester indicated, a number of them are new projects. And like all MPs, when the announcements are made, expectations are almost immediate. It will be useful if you could indicate for each of these projects where in the procurement um, stage those are, because it's designated in two categories, ongoing and um, upcoming projects. When is that upcoming? Ten months from now? We don't know. So some more specifics on each of these projects that we can go back to our respective constituencies and advise our constituents so that their expectations are realistic. Because when you're in drought and in problem, people are expecting immediate resolution. And secondly, Prime Minister, members on both sides, probably more so on your side, because it's great in number, complain about the whole procurement process. And therefore, on all of us mind, what, if any, different procurement arrangements are in place for these? Because the projects that are, as I said, most of the ones you announce are upcoming projects. And it says procurement in progress. That's very vague. Where in the pro procurement process? One, two, what is the projected period of completion of, of the procurement after which commencement of the projects will be. Um, if you could help us with that, it would bring more meaning to all that you have announced. The numbers sound impressive, but if it's not going to come to fruition in a reasonable time, it means nothing. PM, just a minute. Yeah, um, I beg the indulgence of members who, who have questions. I, I just wanted to, to answer the procurement on just quickly. Uh, member, the, the projects that we have announced, which would answer both questions from Northwest and yourself, um, are all projects that are past the tender phase, meaning the, the advertising. So, so they are in procurement. It's very difficult for us to say this is when it will end. Because remember, once you're in procurement, somebody could object. Um, somebody could have some issues which throws the procurement way, way out. So it's very difficult for me to say this is when it will end. What we have said is that these are projects that should start this year, meaning this um, calendar year. So that's, that's the, the, the idea. So. Right, so, so the member is asking me about new projects. Now, so just to, to, to say to you that the most I could say is that they should start this year because once they're in procurement, it's very difficult for us to estimate when they're going to be completed. But I can, I can however, get a more detailed spreadsheet that would say they have passed, for example, the assessment phase, they have been scored and assessed, or the contract has been awarded, or I, I could get that and bring it to Parliament. Right. The other issue now of projects that are already in train, when we're talking about capital works, they are multi-period budget allocations. And what we have presented here is the allocation for the portion of the capital works for this year. So the, the, the Greater Mandible Water Supply Project is a multi-billion dollar, multi-year 
program. What we have presented here is $700 million for this year. So this, out of that. So this is the, 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 what we are presenting is what will happen this fiscal year, meaning from uh, 1st of April to the 31st of March next year. That's what we have presented. Oh, and your question about the, the black tanks. Right, so the, the black tanks are in the procurement process now. We, there are some challenges with the black tanks. The first thing is the country doesn't have, doesn't have the capacity to produce the demand. What has happened is this. All the housing developers are now forward planning and purchasing black tanks to put on the houses that they have developed. So that has really eaten into the capacity for just regular purchase, retail purchase of black tanks. What we have done in putting a demand for 10,000 more is to really stretch the existing capacity. And you know, if you consider it, to import black tanks will be quite expensive because you're basically importing air. So it's better that the investors, I'm using this platform to say to investors that this, the people who produce black tanks and who have an investment in the pro production of these kinds of tanks, that they really should increase their capacity because the government will be making a consistent, at least 10 year investment in water tanks. Just to be clear, remember you said that water tanks are a short term response. I, I wanted to consider it differently. The black tanks are part of the long term resilience building of households for dealing with the water challenges. So it's not, it's not a temporary, it's, 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 a, it's really long term. And so for those people who are in the business of producing black tanks, I would encourage them to increase their production capacity. Each constituency in the first round, because remember this round is 10,000, each constituency will get 100, and we hope to complete that this year, and then next year we do another 100. So you can, you can target and budget for 100 going forward. Just to be clear, members, we are in procurement, meaning that we have placed the, the, the bids are out for the for the tanks. The issue now is how much of it they can actually meet. That's the that's a real issue. So we, we should get through that. I would say hopefully by June we should clear that and we should be able to then start uh, the distribution of tanks. So Um, Chair, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Prime, um, Prime Minister, Prime Minister first, first of all, I think the, the presentation was timely, that water is a national priority, is, is clear and, and, and urgent. What I'd, I'd make two comments, I'd comment on two aspects of what you had to say. Firstly, on the project and the implementation, I, I join a um, colleague from Manchester, in that we're really hoping that implementation occurs and takes place in this period because the, the expectation after today is great. In, what I want to say about implementation, Prime Minister, has to do with the relationship between NWC and NWA and the roads that are affected in, in laying those pipelines. I must tell you that as much as the pipelines are welcome, the road and what it does to the roads and the, the problem of just getting some the road in a, pier, in, a, in, a, in a state of repair after they place a pipeline is a serious problem. I, I, can, I can just point to you and you should know because we share the Spanish Town Road belt and the merchants are calling me every day and saying, when are they going to do something about Spanish Town Road? As an example, but even in smaller communities, the, the NWC, NWA, Nexus, and whatever the arrangement, that we have to get that right. It is that right. What is happening? They dig up the road, and then, it, and if, if the rain falls afterwards, then it's a real problem. So, Prime Minister, we have to have a more serious dialogue with the NWC, NWA. What, I'm, I'm told every time this arises, 
And I raised a question. I'm told, well, we, we, we have an arrangement. NWC is just to fix the pipeline. And, and, and they have an arrangement with NWA. I don't know what that arrangement is. But whatever it is, it is not working. And it's not to the benefit of the communities. And the people are upset. And they're upset with us. And I'm saying we don't have... So, PM, I'm asking you, in, as you go through this, these major projects, which will be disruptive in, in, in their implementation, we have to have an, a, a better arrangement with the NWA. We must. So, I want to make that point urgently. The other, and, and, and Spanish Town Road PM is a sore point. Um, the next point, at the end of your presentation, you touched on the other aspect of water, which is our rivers. And you mentioned Rio Cobra, and I know how important Rio Cobra is to a lot of constituents to the National Water Project. But I, I want to make a special appeal, Prime Minister, to something I've done several times, and that is we overlook the fact that in Kingston, we have the Duhaney River that rises in Kingston. And perhaps because it only runs through my constituency, it is not remembered or overlooked, but it is creating the problem of dealing with the Duane River. And the desilting of the Duane River is creating havoc in, 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 in doing a part in, 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 in doing the parks and in doing a park and part of um, the constituency that is affected. And I urge Prime Minister that when you come to look at your rivers, that we take a special look at the contribution or the problem that the Duane River which, which, which really is an asset. But as it's being treated now, it's a problem because it's not been, it's not been looked at at all, either in the, in the banks that it is supposed to remain or in the community downstream in Riverton that it impacts. And I make a special appeal, Prime Minister, that we look at the problem for an asset that is the Duane River, but because of our neglect of it, over years, many years, it has become a major problem for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister, I just want to, it's really, I want to ask a question, but I will really want to find out in terms of NWA. Do we understand the amount of water that we are losing in this country from broken means all over the country without any kind of regard, any repairs being done? If we fix these broken means, I can assure you that some of our water problems would be solved. And it is something that you need to look at quite seriously, um, Prime Minister. In respect to the other 50, that is a question I really wanted to ask. Um, the 50 constituencies, how would they know in terms of who is eligible for this program? Sorry, PM. Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The question raised by the member from Western St. Andrew regarding the coordination of the NWC and the NWA. Uh, this continues to be a real challenge, uh, clearly for the residents who are discomforted by the uncoordinated digging up of the roads to repair pipes, but it, it poses also an administrative nightmare for the, the ministers who have to treat with it because the two agencies have two separate mandates. One has to repair means as they are brought to their attention uh, and they, they can't wait until there is a budget for repair. Communities will be without water. 
uh, or they could lose quite a bit of water if they don't act. And the NWC, the NWA, when I raise a matter with them, uh, they, they have a budgetary challenge. So they are not able to respond to every single incident of a roadway being disturbed. Now, having said that, the NWC has an obligation to notify the NWA when they are going to disturb a roadway. And depending on the nature of the disruption, they, they, they must repair it. So we have seen situations where they have just dug up the road, uh, put back the, the, the marl, rolled it, and, and left it as is. That should not be the case. Small areas that they have disturbed, uh, they should contract to have it patched. Secondly, what we have, we have made progress, and I want to, to share this with the parliament. We have looked upon roadways as not merely the blacktop surface. We have our roadways now as a utility corridor. So our roadways carry water, sewage, internet, and other um, smart sensors in addition to the right-of-way for utility poles and the sidewalks and the carriageway for vehicles. And so everything is coordinated. Every new road that is being built, it is a joint operation between the NWA and the NWC. So if you were to take the South Coast Highway Improvement Project, you will note that almost every meter of road that is laid, there is a provision for piping. That's the coordination that is there. Under the SPARC program, the directive has been given. If the NWC has plans to do any improvement of water infrastructure on any of the roads that would fall within the purview of the SPARC program, it must be coordinated with the NWA. So when we go to do our consultations, you're, you're going to also want to identify, flag for the NWA, where there are water mains that need replacement, where you see leaks on your roads, because we will use that opportunity to do one intervention, not just to repair the road, but also to repair or replace the water main on it. So there is progress being made in that regard. Ultimately, I'm the, the, the minister with responsibility for roads and water and to provide the policy direction. So the listener, uh, the average Jamaican listening, so why don't you just give the policy directive that if the NWC disturbs the road, then the NWA must fix it or the NWC must, must patch it. The, the issue is really one of the budget. Remember now, when we come to Parliament, which we will do later, we vote on a certain level of expenditure. And the expenditure is itemized in ministries, departments, agencies, and they are fixed, they have ceilings. We may make provisions, but oftentimes the provisions are quite used up. When, so when we are making the budget, we may budget for $50 million, $100 million, let's say half a billion dollars to do patching and repairs. But you can never tell when a pipe needs to be replaced, repaired, road needs to be disturbed, that is over and above what the provision is. But you have to respond if a pipe is broken and a community is without water. In other words, member, a lot of what we experience in terms of poor administration as we look at it, it is really the stop gap and the shortness, I'm using that term, of resources to stretch to cover proper administrative responses. Meaning that, yes, we could always make the policy, the policy is there, but when you did not budget to dig up a road and repair it, and there is no budget for it, what happens? The solution, colleagues, and I've said it this way in this house, is that we must grow our economy, we must manage our fiscal resources such that we create more tax revenues, not more taxes, 
such that we are able to match the policy directives with the actual response. If we had the adequate budget, it would not be an issue for the NWC and the NWA to properly patch a road that they have disturbed over and above what they had initially budgeted. That's the, that's the, that's the real issue. We have taken now, based upon the budget that we have put in place under SPARC, $20 billion, to ensure that the two agencies don't work at cross purposes. The NWA and the NWC, given the budget, work in concert to ensure that once we are going to disturb a road, if the pipe needs to be replaced, that will be done. So it's one activity that will lead to, in, in my opinion, the, the greater convenience for the, you, we, have, we have started those discussions. Uh, in relation to the Duhaney River, I must confess, member, uh, the, du the, rain, the Duhaney River is not one of those rivers that I have paid a lot of attention to. It has come up, however, when we were looking at the eventual demobilization of the, the Riverton City Dome. It is one of the rivers that has been affected badly by pollution in that area. I will give it further consideration from an environmental perspective on what can be done to protect it. Um, in addition to the, the other question was, member, how will you be notified? By the usual route, a letter will come under my signature. <laughs> a letter will come under my signature to those who have been given the... the it usually comes by the Friday after my, after my presentation on the Tuesday. Uh, and then for those who were not given the allocation, we will send a note to you to say, we have made a provision. We, remember, we have left that $5 million. If there is an emergency in your constituency. So for example, there's a school that for some reason doesn't have water, or there's a community for some reason, then from that $5 million provision over the next four weeks, we can respond. One question. Oh. Member, sorry. Member from Central Westmoreland was before you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Prime Minister, there are several communities in Westmoreland Central that are without portable water. I must thank you for your quick intervention as it relates to trucking of water in the parish. And I must also thank you for the pipe lane intervention that will lead from Ruin River to Negril. However, there are some communities that are in close proximity there's a stone throw away from the watershed that are without potable water. And uh, I think you could ask the good minister who continue to serve the people of this noble country very well to these communities to do some assessment in which we can bring water to these communities. As I said before, these communities are just on top of the watershed. And these people have to be going through to carry water, whether by donkey or whether by cars. So that is one. And two, um, as you mentioned earlier about the NWA and the, and the NWC um, programs, there are several roads that I start to do rehabilitation. And after rehabilitation, I notice NWC, well, pipe leaking start. But what I am suggesting here is that 
we need to change out some of these old pipes so that when we do road rehabilitation, we don't need to go back and dig up the road. Because then it actually brings us back to where we were. And, um, and so I'm just asking for your intervention where this is concerned. Thank you. Um, thank you. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I just really have one question. As one of those firmly in the 13 constituencies um, that you spoke about, um, I don't think I could go back to the constituency and leave here without talking about water. Yes, we understand that this is a program directed specifically at those that are um, affected badly by the drought. And I understand that. But the situation of some of the other constituents, the other Jamaicans, which may be less affected by the drought, still requires choking of water as a solution that we are seeing now. And uh, the current demand sometimes is not being adequately met. And so I was wondering whether or not you did not think it appropriate to see how the trucking of water to these constituencies that has been um, an issue to date could also be alleviated um, through this program or something similar. Because as you would rightly agree, water is life. Yeah? So I'm speaking on behalf of the lives of those members along that strip, and some of them might very well be in your constituency too. Yes, but I mean, I, th I thought I would ask the question because I am concerned that we are not being adequately served consistently in terms of the choking of water for the problems that exist in that area. Prime Minister, you mentioned in your response, Spark, when you had come to Parliament in February, you said the consultations would be held by the end of March, which I'd indicated wasn't realistic. But we haven't had any communication from your office or anywhere else to state exactly how the consultations are to be held. And the expectation out there from constituents is we are, we are a joke, we are holding up this thing. So when will we get something that will say this is the basis for the consultation and what the criteria for the consultation is? Because Frankly, I don't want to go to a consultation where everybody going to say, me want my road fixed, because that's what everybody who comes to a consultation is going to say. So I would like you to give us a time frame as to when we are going to be equipped to hold the consultations and then how we go forward from there. Prime Minister. Uh, PM. Prime Minister, thank you very much for the statement on the drought situation and, most importantly, the measures taken by your government to correct same. However, Prime Minister, my phone has not stopped going off because in your budget presentation, you made the announcement on Mason Hall and persons are saying you, you did not repeat it. So they are wondering if you had removed the funding to treat with this emergency. And although I am telling them you will do no such thing, the, the people who are dependent upon the greater masonal supply that would take Tower Isle, Ryan Nuevo, Othersfield, Mango Valley, Rockabessa into consideration, Days Mountain and Mason Hall, as well as you had listed out a number of springs in your presentation and to treat with the Geisel, Heartlands, Jeffrey Town. And I know MP Carencia is having the same challenge. So the people are watching and they are wondering if by not announcing them again, if they were taken off the list. So they need a little reassurance from their Prime Minister. Let me say, let, let me say that, Mr. Speaker, 
it is, it is not the, the practice that, um, you know, members on the government side ask questions, unless it is coordinated. But it is, it is good. It is good. But, but I tell you what, uh, member from St. Mary, um, Western, it is good that you asked the question, because I neglected to say that these were not all the projects that we were doing. In other words, we, we, we just listed some of them. <laughs> we, we, we just listed some of them. Because, yes, member from Western St. Mary, the, the, the Mason Hall project is still on track and will start early. It, well, it is on way to begin, as, as you know. The member is asking the question to highlight. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Mr. Speaker, the question regarding, um, there was a question on, by the member from St. Catherine East, Eastern regarding wastage of water because of broken mains. Member, I should point out, and I neglected to in my presentation, that a project that crossed administration, started in 2009, continued under um, the, the administration uh, in 2011 to 2015, and we continued it, is the national, um, it's a non-revenue water project. And you would be proud to know that as a result of that project, and just for J Jamaicans' understanding, it, it was an investment where a private company came in with technology that could test the water flow in our pipes to identify leaks. So we could be proactive. Instead of waiting for a leak to become evident, then we repair, we could know where leaks are happening that we are not seeing. And that led to an even greater level of planning and coordination between our entities. So as a result of that, in the Kingston and St. Andrew area, we have reduced non-revenue water. That means water that we produce for which we get no revenue from because of leakages or other things. We have, we have reduced that by 38%. Well, no, sorry. We have, we have reduced it to 38%. Yes. Mm. 70. From 70%. Can you imagine? That of, all the, that of all the water you, you produce, 70% of it, you get no revenue. Thankfully, we are down to 38%. And we, the project still continues. In Portmore, we are down to 45%. The project is slated to go island-wide, but it is being done in phases. So I, I just wanted to, to say to you, member, that yes, there are leaks, but within Kingston and St. Andrew and Portmore, we are on top of that problem. Island-wide, the same project is, is going to be rolled out. Um, the other question about uh, the, the, the member from West Berlin Central, uh, as I pointed out in my presentation, member, we are paying special focus to um, Hanover and West Berlin, both parishes which have been given, which have had a, a really serious negative impact from the drought. Um, the question regarding what can we do to assist the communities that are being impacted by irregular and inconsistent water supply outside of the drought condition. Uh, member, we have reserved the five million. I'm going, your, your, your plea makes sense because I know my constituents are going to be calling to say all, that's all you leave. So we will look at increasing that, that amount, member. And it is from that amount that we will do the, the special interventions that are required. Sorry, the, member, I, I really didn't want to turn this into a spark debate, but, but I think, I, I think the, the member deserves, uh, the member's questions are appropriate. I did say we would start the end of March. What has happened, member, is that the program 
is a little bit more involved than we had previously um, anticipated, especially now that we have brought in the water component. It also, the, the other issue is that we, 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 we need to build out a proper registry of our roads, and that is, that is being done. So we are using all the technology to properly capture the roads and use the satellite technology to measure. But what you would have discovered is that there are some roads that we don't know whether it is parish council or local, and so they have to go and investigate. And those things take a little longer than, than, than we had expected. The truth is they, they don't understand. They, don't, they wouldn't understand that. So I, I, those points have to be made. So what we don't want to do is to go off without proper planning. And it is going to be important that every member of parliament has a proper registry of their roads with proper measurement, proper assessment, and then the coordination as well as where are pipes laid. So remember now, we have, we, we, we have been laying pipes long before we even named some roads. And they're not on digital systems that you can overlay road with pipe networks. All of that is being behind the scenes done. The beauty of the SPARC program is that at the end of it, we will have a proper national infrastructure grid coordinated between NWA, NWC, telecommunications, national security, and all the other utilities that use the road corridor. No, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to give you a time because I fear that you will stand up and say, no, we, we, we are working assiduously to, to start. Assiduously to start. As soon as we are ready. But it's, it's, it's cl clearly, we can't, we can't allow April to, to pass and we don't start. So that's, that's what, I don't want to give you a specific time. House leader. Yes, Mrs. Mr. Speaker, thank you for your patience. Um, could you proceed with the agenda items as listed, please? Thank you very much. Announcement. Laid on the table of the House is the annual report and audited financial statements of the Fair Trading Commission for the year ending 2015-2016. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the item of announcement, I note that there are some changes and I take it that you are going to... Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, you were preempting a situation, member. It is now time that we will now say that we have seen or we are seeing a different face in the chair of the clerk of the house. And so at this time, we will congratulate the movement of Miss Colleen Low to the position of clerk of the house. We do hope that you will continue to work very effectively with that same smile as you go along day to day for the betterment of the parliament. Thank you. And the matter for which you just made mention of the commencement of Ms. Lowe as our new clerk to the House. You also are aware, Mr. Speaker, that there is some outstanding matter on this issue from the last sitting. And I was expecting that as we were advised last week of certain developments taking place in respect to the former clerk, clerk to this house. When we met last, we never knew that she would not be before us again, but that is the case, and we are mindful of the circular that has been sent to all members of parliament. Mr. Speaker, for all my years in this parliament, there are certain courtesies that are usually extended to our officers. 
Miss Curtis has limited office without that usual courtesy extended to her. Of the house in its sitting, acknowledge her service yeah. and pay tribute to her. Yeah. It would be it would be remiss of us to continue the sitting today at the end of that tenure as if it's business as usual. And Mr. Speaker, the opposition would not sit and allow that to happen because we'll become complicit with such practice. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, the member and I did have a discussion and I indicated that we will be doing the courtesies um, when the leader of the house and the speaker are present. He asked for uh, some to indicate when. I told him I'd do so before the end of this sitting. And that's the understanding we have. If I may, if I may, if I may, if I may, Mr. Speaker, the comments by the acting house leader is correct, but it is inadequate. It is inadequate and it is unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, the, the, I said it to her. I said it to her in our discussion. And I asked her to convey some definitive decision. And she has failed to do that. No, so it is, it is. Anna, member, I could ask you to yield a minute. I uh, me member. The, the, the acting PM. The acting uh, leader of government business, of, of um, opposition business. Um, is pointing out a convention which has always existed in this parliament and which the government has a duty to ensure that that convention continues. It is never a contemplation that a speaker or the, the clerk of the house, which is such an important position, um, constitutionally recognized position, that could demit office and the courtesies um, and convention surrounding that office is not observed with dignity. So I want to assure the acting leader of opposition business that that will be done. And appropriately, when the House um, is at its full strength with the speaker and the leader of government business and the leader of opposition business and the leader of the opposition are all present to pay their respects and courtesies. Um, <coughs> no, but I'm being recognized by the speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is, we don't, this we don't need to have a contention or we don't need to be at each other here. Mr. Speaker, I did say to the acting uh, leader of the opposition uh, business that I would advise him before the end of the sitting or by the end of the sitting when the appropriate courtesies would be extended. I did so, and you got up and accused me of lying. I did not, I, I did tell you that. No, no, just a moment. Just, Mr. Speaker, I'm not finished, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member said, and we can check answered. He did not say that I indicated that I would tell him by or before the end of the sitting. Point of order. Number one, I did not say that the member was lying. What I did say, which I repeat, what I will repeat what I did say. I will repeat what I did say. I will repeat what I say. Mr. Speaker, will you allow me? The House leader is disrupting me. I'm not going to speak with the disruption, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, member, 
your mic is on no other mic is on please her voice is overbearing but mr speaker mr speaker i will repeat what i said and for the records the member did indicate to me at the beginning and i told her that is unacceptable to start the proceedings without that being addressed. I rose because we were proceeding without what the Prime Minister, and I'm grateful that the Prime Minister made the intervention to say what he said. I asked, I told the member that it would be improper to commence. She mentioned about at the, at the, at the, at the, um, more at the, at the, at the, at the adjournment motion. That is at the end of the sitting. And my point is that we cannot comment, we could, ought not to have commenced the sitting and the business of the House without addressing that matter. And that is the crux of my contention. And to say otherwise, to say otherwise would be misrepresenting what I said. Now, yeah, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, and I respect. Mr. Speaker, when I indicated to the member that when the speaker is present and the host leader present, at that time he will do the courtesies. He said he wanted a specific time. I indicated to him that I would advise him of a specific time before the end of the sitting. He did not insist that we must do it at the opening. He accepted that. And that is why the understanding we had was that I would advise him before the end of the sitting when we would extend it. That's the understanding. That was the understanding. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, um, I ask if you would continue with the agenda items as listed. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Member, member, at this time, at this time, we will close this because we have had both, at this, at, at this, at, at, at this time, at this, at this time, member, both, at, at what point of order are you raising, madam? It, no, 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 no. Both, both, both leader of government business and leader of opposition business made a claim and the Prime Minister spoke as to how it is going to get done. And so we will close that for now. We are going to close that for now and move to the next agenda item. She, she's rising on a point of order for what? There is nothing on the floor. No. And I am ruling. I am ruling. I am ruling that we leave that on the floor. Bills brought before the Senate. Miss Member, Member. You do not have the floor. You don't have the floor. Sit. If I, I, will, I will use the standing order if I have to, please. No, no. My, member, member, you do not have the floor. M with a, member, w we, are, we are at bills brought from the Senate.
But the standing order has been followed. Clark, you have the floor. Members, Madam Clerk, please. At section 40 of the standing orders, section 43, subsection 4, if a member shows disregard for the authority of the chair or abuses the rule of the house, by persistently and willfully obstructing the business of the house or otherwise the speaker shall direct the attention of the house to the incident mentioning by name the member concerned the speaker shall then call upon a minister to move that the member for be suspended from the services of the house and the speaker shall forthwith Put the question, no second are being required, and no amendment, adjournment, or debate being followed. Members, let, let, civility, let civility reign in here. I have ruled. I, I, This, this is the last time. Madam Clark, you have the floor. The following is a message from the President of the Senate. To the Honorable House of Representatives, I have the honor to advise the Honorable House of Representatives that on the 27th day of March, 2024, the bill entitled An Act to Apply a Sum Out of the Consolidated Fund to the service of the year ending on the 31st day of March, 2025, and to appropriate the sums granted in this session of Parliament was passed in the Senate without amendment. Thomas Tavares Finson, OJ, CD, KC, JP. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm asked for, reco I'm asked for recommitment of the item announcements. <laughs> The question, the question is that a recommitment to the item before announcement. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Do, do. We have a divide.
Mr. Bartlett, Mr. Brown, Big Brown, no, no, no. Dr. Dr. Brownberg. The question was asked. Was the question was asked where you had asked for a recommittal. I put it to the floor, and they know the, the nays have, have, have the, the majority. And we asked for you, there, there was a divide, and we now go to an individual call. Dr. Brownberg. Dr. Chang, Dr. Charles, Dr. Charles, Miss, Mr. Charles Jr., Mr. Chin, Mr. Chuck, Dr. Clark, Mr. Cousins, Miss Crawford, Mrs. Cuthbert Flynn. Miss Daly, yes. Mr. Davis, yes. Mr. Davis, Miss Davis, no. she's not here. No. Dr. Dunn, yes. Mr. Golding, yes. Mr. Graham, yes. Miss Grange, no. Mr. Green. Dr. Guy, Miss Hamilton, Miss Hannah, Mr. Enriquez, Mr. Henry, Mr. Holness, Mr. Holness, Miss. <laughs> Mr. Hutchinson, Mr. Hilton, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Lawrence, Mr. Lawrence, Miss Lee, Mrs. Malahu Fort, Mr. Main, Mr. Mackenzie, Mr. Miller. Ms. Morrison, no. Mr. Montague, no. Mr. Morgan, no. Mrs. Nita Garvey, Mr. Paulwell, Mr. Phillips, Dr. Phillips, Mr. Mr. Robertson, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Samuda. <laughs> Mr. Shaw, no. Mr. Siblis, no. Mr. Slowly, no. Miss Smith, no. Mr. Terlong, Dr. Tufton, Mrs. Vaz. Mr. Vaz, Mr. Warmington, Mr. Wheatley, Mr. Williams, hmm? oh. oh, my apologies, Mr. Wheatley, Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Williams, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Witter. And Mr. Wright.
Members, as the vote was cast, seven yes, 31 no, 22 absent, the no's have it. Petitions, papers, reports from committees, notice of motion given orally, Mr. Speaker, permission to speak from a seat other than my own. You're granted. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance and the Public Service, I beg to give notice that at the next meeting of the House, I will move on his behalf to introduce and have read a first time a bill shortly entitled the Appropriation Amendment Act 2024. Mr. Speaker, I beg to give notice that at the next meeting of the House, I will move, be it resolved with reference to the resolution approved by this Honorable House on the 19th day of December, 2023, appointing a select committee to sit jointly with a similar committee appointed by the Senate to conduct the statutory review of the Domestic Violence Act. That the committee be allowed to hold hybrid meetings that are partly virtual and partly physical, utilizing available information and communication technologies in the manner more specifically outlined below. Preserving the rights, powers, and privileges, including voting rights, normally accorded to a member of a committee, the committee is hereby empowered to, one, convene and hold meetings in virtual spaces created using information and communication technologies, which shall be considered committee meetings for the purpose of the mandate of the committee. Two, allow access and participation from remote locations as are enabled by means of information and virtual technologies by members and other persons authorized by the committee. Three, include members accessing and participating from remote locations as a part of its quorum. Four, receive Consider, deliberate on, and respond to feedback and submissions in formats, modes, and media, and via platforms, modes, and media, enabled by means of information and communication technologies from any person. Five, consider any and all information generated, communicated, and received via formats, platforms, modes, or media as enabled by means of information and communication technologies as forming a part of the record of the committee's meetings. I further beg to give notice that at a later stage today, I will move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion. Question and answers to questions. Motion that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice. Motion relating to sitting of the House. Motion for leave to introduce bills presentation of bills without leave of the House first obtained. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance and the Public Service, I now move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me on his behalf to introduce and have read a first time a bill shortly entitled the Appropriation Amendment Act 2024. 
The question is that the standing orders be suspended to allow the minister to take the first reading of a bill shortly entitled the Appropriation Amendment Act 2024. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The eyes of it. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance and the Public Service, I now move that a bill shortly entitled the Appropriation Amendment Act 2024 be read a first time. A bill shortly entitled the Appropriation Amendment Act 2024 read a first time. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance and the Public Service, I beg to give notice of second reading of the bill. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance and the Public Service, I further beg to give notice that at a later stage today, I will move on his behalf for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me on his behalf to take second reading of the bill and to take it through all its concluding stages. Minister Grinch, public business. Public business, Minister Grinch. Mr. Speaker, I now move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion, notice of which I gave earlier. The question is that the standing order be suspended to enable the minister to take the motion, notice of which she had given earlier. Those in favor? Those against? Minister? Mr. Speaker, I now move that the motion of which I gave notice earlier be approved. The question is that the motion no notice of which the minister gave earlier be approved. Those in favor? Those against? The eyes of it. Minister Williams. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance and the Public Service, I now move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me on his behalf to take second reading of the bill, notice of which I gave on his behalf earlier, and also for me to take it on his behalf through all its concluding stages. The question is for the standing orders to be suspended to enable the minister to take the second reading of the bill, notice of which she gave earlier, and also for her to take it through all its concluding stages. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Ayes have it. Minister? Mr. Speaker, the purpose of the amendments to the Appropriation Act 2024 is to exclude the amounts related to statutory expenditures that were inadvertently included in the Act. These amounts are shown in Table 1, which accompanies this brief, which represents a summary of the 2024-2025 central government expenditure budget as amended and approved by the Standing Finance Committee in March 2024. Mr. Speaker, the amendments are necessary as the Constitution stipulates that statutory expenditures shall not be voted on by the House of Representatives. Mr. Speaker, statutory expenditures are expenditures that are charged on the consolidated fund or on the general revenues and assets of Jamaica by virtue of provision in the Constitution or by virtue of the provisions of any other law in force. Mr. Speaker, the amendments are to enable compliance with Section 116.3 of the Constitution, which indicates that that amounts classified 
as statutory expenditure in the estimates of expenditures shall not be voted on by the House of Representatives and should therefore not be included in the Appropriation Act. Mr. Speaker, the amendments to the Appropriation Act 2024 do not affect the heads of estimates, which do not include provisions for statutory expenditures, neither do the amendments affect the aggregate 2024-2025 central government expenditure estimates of $1.341 trillion. So in effect, Mr. Speaker, um, in the estimates of expenditure, the yellow book, all those numbers are correct. Mr. Speaker, the sections of the act to be amended are one, section two to be amended to reflect the current aggregate voted sum excluding statutory expenditures of $817,265,242,000 instead of $849,896,471,000. Column two of the schedule in relation to the affected heads of expenditure to be amended by replacing the figures on the sums granted, which include statutory expenditures with the sums excluding statutory expenditures which are to be voted by Parliament and included in the Appropriation Act. Mr. Speaker, the affected heads of estimates and the, sum, and the sums involved are as follows. So on the heads, His Excellency the Governor General and staff, the sum in the Appropriation Act 2024, including statutory provisions, was 532,852,000. The amended sum, excluding statutory provisions, is 149,664,000. Houses of Parliament, 2,439,963,000. The amended sum is 2,413,000,000. Office of the Public Defender, 394,357,000. The amended sum is 367,106,000. Office of the Auditor General, 1,404,352,000. The amended sum is 1,380,839,000. Office of the Services Commissions, 518,977,000. The amended sum is 500,354,000. Office of the Children's Advocate, 386,665,000. The amended sum is 359,172,000. Independent Commission of Investigations, 837,299,000. The amended sum is 809,134,000. Integrity Commission, 1,851,371,000. The amended sum is 1,812,771,000. Independent Fiscal Commission, 273,482,000. The amended sum is 257. 690,000, 257,690,000 pensions, 44 billion, the amended sum is 13 billion, 856 million, 376,000, Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, 820 million, 874,000, the amended sum is 799 million, 804,000, and finally the judiciary, 9,431,721,000. The amended sum is 7,554,474,000. Mr. Speaker, with the exclusion of the sums classified as statutory expenditure, the subtotals referenced as carried forward and brought forward 
in column two at the bottom of the appropriation bill and at the, at the, the bottom and the top of each page of the schedule are to be amended as follows. So if we look at page three, we would be deleting the figure, 45,868,243 carried forward and replacing it with the figure, 45,278,965,000. Page four, deleting the figure, 45,868,253,000 brought forward on page four and replacing with the figure, 45,278,965,000. On page four, deleting the figure, 323,464,000, I'm sorry, um, 323,464,312,000 carried forward on page four and replacing with the figure 292,731,400,000. Page five, deleting the figure, 323,464,312,000 brought forward and replacing with the figure, 292,731,400,000. Okay. Page six, deleting the figure, 454, Billion two hundred and thirty-eight million and thirty-nine thousand brought forward and replacing it with a figure four hundred and twenty-one billion six hundred and six million eight hundred and ten thousand. Page six, deleting the figure seven hundred and ninety-nine billion thirty-four million six hundred and eighty-two thousand carried forward and replacing with the figure seven hundred and sixty-six billion four hundred and three million. 453,000. Page 7, deleting the figure 799 billion, 34 million, 682,000, brought forward and replacing with the figure 766 billion, 403 million, 453,000. The total figure on page 7, representing total sum granted, is to be amended by deleting the figure 849 billion. 896,471,000 and replacing with the figure Mr. Speaker, it's quite unprecedented that less than two weeks after the close of our budget debate, we would be called back to address a matter of this nature. I want to ask what has given rise to the errors that were made in including the public bodies and the other entities. And I ask within the context that these are technocrats who have been preparing budgets for many, many years. And from my recollection, I can't recall ever having a situation like this. And I ask also within the context that while human error is not fatal, I would expect that there are checks and balances within the process that if someone makes a mistake, it would be caught somewhere later down before it is actually brought to the parliament, tabled, voted, and passed by the parliament. And secondly, I want to ask what is the material effect of the error that has taken place and whether it has affected the warrants that are issued to these public bodies and agencies and whether that has in any way impacted their ability to execute their functions, pay their bills, honor the obligations that they have. Um, you want to answer to the next At the same time, Mr. Speaker, was this expenditure reviewed by the um, Auditor General? I believe that she normally goes through, or the Department goes through this and sent a report back to Parliament approving 
or make a recommendation. The question is, was this done by the Auditor General? And it was, if, whether, if it was done by the Auditor General, as done in all other cases, how come she didn't pick this up and send it back to Parliament? The appropriate person to have found this is the Auditor General. Is the Auditor General? So the issue is, was she sleeping on the job? Or what? That she didn't find this when she approved this bit of expenditure that came back here. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In responding to the questions from the member, um, member, if you look in the yellow book, it will be clear that it was an error in transposing figures from um, the table one that I gave you into the Appropriations Act. Um, the fact that it was discover discovered uh, quickly, and we're here to correct that, I, you know, I applaud that, um, because sometimes when errors are made, uh, um, persons don't step forward to say this is an error that was made. So this was, um, this was just an error in, in copying a set of numbers into the Appropriations Act. Hold, hold on, there is a... Madam Minister. The second part of the question, the impact, while well, having corrected, having, once we're done with this process, then it will enable the warrants to begin to go out. Mr. Speaker, the second part of my question has not yet been answered. Was the estimate of expenditure reviewed by the Auditor General and so approved and certified? That's my quite the second part of my question, but that part has not been answered as yet. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the corrections are sent to the House by the Minister of Finance and the Public Service. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. With all, with all due respect, I ask a question, and I, the minister who is tabling this should answer without being probed by anybody else on advice. It's a simple question I've asked. It's a simple question. She does not need advisors on this. Okay? It's customary for the Auditor General to go through the estimate of expenditure and send her approval. Certification. The question I'm asking. Was that done by the Auditor General? If not, why? We broke the we have, we have broken precedent. Minister. All right. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm advised that the Appropriation Act is not reviewed by the Auditor General. The Auditor General does not review the estimates. Thank you. Oh, mem member, member, member. Member, mem member, member, I will give you your time, but the, the member, the other member was before you. I, I want to follow up on the second part of my question, and I ask about the impact of the warrants. We are at the 9th of April, and I assume now having the correction, and we'll go through the process of passing it. My question remains. What impact will this have? Because without warrants, they can't spend. They may have obligations. Um, salaries would be due in another week and a half. What impact will this have on any of the agencies that are affected by the error? Minister. Mr. Speaker, once we get through passing the appropriations, uh, the amendment to the Appropriations Act this afternoon, it will enable the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service to issue warrants to continue the work of the government. Um, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, the, minister, the minister simply repeated the answer given before, which is not in, re 
It's not a responsive answer to the question asked. My question is, my, I will ask the question in a different way. Can the minister assure the parliament that there is no adverse implication from this amendment or any liabilities arising therefrom? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is no adverse impact on the affairs of the government from doing this. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the point I was getting at is after the estimate expenses table in this house, you cannot proceed with the debate of the budget until we get a certification from the, or a response, or review from the, the, George, shut your mouth. George Hilton, leave me alone. I am saying here, Mr. Speaker. All right, all right. I am saying. Stop. All right, I will draw it. Okay. I will draw it. I am saying, Mr. Speaker, the point is. Wait, man. That after the budget is laid in the South, you cannot commence the, the, the budget debate until after review of the Order General. That's what I was getting at, Mr. Speaker. That's all I was getting at. Any other comment? If there is none, Minister. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> on behalf of the Minister of Finance and the Public Service, I ask that the bill be read a second time. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favor? Those against? Eyes of it. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Appropriation Act 2024 to include all expenditure classified as statutory expenditure and for connected matters read the first time. A second time, sorry. The House will now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. I put clause one. Those in favor? Those against? Eyes of it. I put clause two. Those in favor? Those against? Eyes of it. I put clause three. Those in favor? Those against? Clause the eyes of it. I put the title and enacting clause. Those in favor? Those against? Eyes of it. The question is that I do report the bill as having passed committee stage without. Any amendments? Those in favor? Those against? The eyes of it. The House will now resume to its full city. I do report the bill as having passed committee stage without any amendments. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I now ask that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those in favor? Those against? The eyes of it. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Appropriation Act 2024 to exclude all expenditure classified as statutory expenditure 
and for connected matters read a third time and passed. This house now stand. House leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is not contemplated for us to do any further business today. I therefore ask that the house adjourns for a date to be fixed. The question is on the floor. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The eyes have it. This house now stands adjourned.